I think I'm going to force a friend to stay quiet for one of the hours. I think with that, I think five. I'll take that. For Adderburst 2024, Representative Town Meeting is called to order. First order of business is to confirm the meeting has been properly warned. All right, the town clerk confirms the meeting's been properly warned. Um, please, town meeting members, make sure to check in with the attendants when you enter. Only authorized people can sit within the roped area. Members should have your name tags with your lanyards. Please make sure to check back in at the check-in table after lunch. And please make sure to return your badges to the check-in table after the meeting is concluded. Uh, moderator inquires whether the uh, whether we have a quorum, and if so, how many members have checked in? They didn't hear me. We have 87 representatives here in attendance. I want to thank everybody who braved the weather to come out, and hopefully we'll have more people over the course of the day. I just want to make sure everybody's aware the exits are in the back of the gymnasium. There's also an exit over here that'll take you out to uh, the front of the high school. The restrooms are out to the back of the gymnasium and around the corner. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask Paula Melton to make some opening remarks. Turn it around. Why don't you turn it around and speak to the... Good morning, fellow representatives. Paula Melton, District 7. I stand before you today struggling with fear, grief, and inner turmoil. I also stand before you with immense gratitude and with hope. Let's start with the fear, grief, and turmoil. When I look around our town, I see growing inequality and great suffering. Many people have no permanent place to call home. Other people, including myself, have the luxury of choice to offer a small kindness or not, to offer a small cruelty or not. Meanwhile, all around Vermont, climate change is threatening our way of life and our livelihoods. Extreme weather imperils our farms and our orchards. Rising temperatures put seasonal tourism at risk. And we're at a point where many people have been so traumatized by flooding that they feel intense anxiety every time it rains. And then there's our country and our world. All around us, democracy is in danger. Authoritarian and nationalist regimes have taken root in an alarming number of places. Under the guise of anti-fascism and anti-terrorism, so-called strong men with absolute power are waging wars. They are attempting to conquer their neighbors and create full-fledged empires. These men are assaulting constitutions and holding sham elections. These men are e interfering in our own elections here at home. Power is a curious thing. Most of the people who want power really shouldn't have it. 
but most regular people, like all of you and me, would not touch, touch true power with a 10-foot pole. So here we are at Representative Town Meeting. Uh, I don't know how many of us, 150 or so regular people doing our best to live into this whole democracy thing. The beauty of RTM is that no one in this room, not even our esteemed moderator, has absolute power. We arrive here as equals, even members of the select board, despite the traditional seating arrangements, get one vote apiece. We certainly have our tensions. The separation of powers can be uncomfortable. Some people see RTM as a procedural afterthought, a rubber stamp for whatever the allegedly wiser and better informed select board has already decided. And yet, every year that I've had the privilege of serving at RTM, starting back in 2013, we, those of us who make up this body, have proven that we are far more than a rubber stamp. We have debated in good faith. We have deliberated together. And our debates and deliberations have led to some surprising outcomes, like the 1% local option sales tax, like a new sustainability coordinator position that was created from the floor by Orion Barber. Just last year, we added $350,000 to the budget through an overwhelming yay vote. Why would we do such a thing? We did it to fund new firefighter positions while protecting federal pandemic money, AKA ARPA funds. Now, if you've read the Finance Committee report, and as clerk of this year's Finance Committee, I really hope you have, you'll know that that triumph was temporary. But let's not get discouraged. What this shows us is that sharing power is hard. The truth is, democracy is always going to be imperfect. Some examples. We do our best to speak for the people who cannot be here. We try, but our voices can never fully substitute for their voices. Meetings can be long. Debate gets exhausting. We can't all get what we want. And frankly, everyone in this room, given the right opportunity, has the potential and the freedom to be annoying as hell. OK, so how about if we make a pact, part one of the pact? Let's try to keep the annoying as hell part to a low roar today. I'm looking to our esteemed moderator to help with that. Thank you in advance. Part two of the pact. If people slip up on part one, let's all of us close our eyes, take a deep breath, and remind ourselves that we all have an equal voice, that we all have an equal vote. Here in this room and here in our hearts, democracy remains an undying flame because collectively sharing power is our birthright as human beings. Power to the people. I understand that the deaf interpreters need, may need to move, and so we're going to take two minutes to facilitate that.
Do you want me to speak? Next, we're going to invite the members of Troop 6299 to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The troop leaders are Mariah Carney, Michelle Como, and Essie Farquhar. The troop members, Ivy Burns Heisler, Addison Como, Aubrey Como, Ive, Iva Como, Stephanie Dell, Lily Farquhar, Colleen Keppel, Autumn Little, Olivia Nutting, Aviana Person, Zaniah Person, Lizzie Stark, Julie Stafford, and Josie Vargas. If everybody would rise. All right. It's in Thank you very much. It's customary before we begin the business of the meeting to have a moment of silence. I'd like to just uh, recite the names of representative town meeting members who have passed since our last meeting including Corwin Elwell, who was left off the list accidentally last year, Corwin Elwell, Jerry Benjamin, Donna Borofsky, Burden Eldridge, Charles Henderson, Peggy McAllister, Charles Robb Sr., Jerry Rounds, Jane Southworth, and Stuart Thurber. The town clerk is now recognized to read the opening and closing paragraphs of the warning. Good morning, everyone. The legal voters qualified to vote in representative town meeting are hereby notified and warned to meet in the gymnasium of the Brattleboro Union High School on Saturday, March 23rd, 2024, at 8.30 a.m. to act on the articles listed below. Articles that have not been acted upon by 5 p.m. will be moved to March 24th, 2024 at 8.30 a.m. unless the body votes to continue past 5 p.m. Dated at Brattleboro, Vermont, this first day of February, 2024, Brattleboro Select Board, Ian Goodnow, Chair, Franz Reichsman, Vice Chair, Peter Case, Clerk, Elizabeth McLaughlin and Daniel Quip. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now briefly review some of the meeting procedures. Um, Robert's rules govern procedures here at Brattleboro's town meeting. Robert's rules calls for amendments and motions to be in writing and provided to the moderator which enables an accurate record keeping and consideration of the specifically requested action. When you speak, please use one of the two microphones so viewers at home can hear your questions and comments. Please always state your name and your district prior to speaking. Please don't move the chairs. They're set up to maximize social distancing. Keeping the rows aligned allows the counters to be accurate when there's a division roll call. Uh, if members of the public wish to be heard who are not town meeting members, please step up to the microphone, raise your hand, and wait to be recognized by the moderator. 
Today's refreshments and lunches are provided by members of the BUHS QSA Queer Straight Alliance Group, and they'll be here until after the lunch break. The lunch order forms are in your packets. BUHS QSA is the largest student club at BUHS and mixes peer support, school-wide education, and works to improve conditions for all students, especially those who identify as LGBTQIA+. Comments will be limited to two minutes, with exceptions to be determined in the moderator's discretion or vote of the assembly. Comments must be germane to the motion on the floor. My role as moderator is to make sure that all voices are heard and the meeting is to run effectively. I strongly prefer not to limit member comments, but my role is to make sure the meeting keeps on track. Uh, the meeting is being broadcast live by BCTV on Comcast channel 1079 and on Facebook at Brattleboro Community TV. The meeting will be rebroadcast on channel 1079 and available online at BrattleboroTV.org. The meeting is being interpreted for the deaf and hard of hearing by Elizabeth Fox, Janet Dickinson, Crystal Haynes, and Virginia Clark, and we thank them for their assistance and their service. Uh, I'm gonna note that uh, specific procedures relating to voting will be discussed as we get to the end of the uh, warned articles. Uh, um, and we'll talk then specifically about how those motions will be made and nominations will be taken. Um, we have a quorum which has been defined for today's meeting at 77 members being 50% plus one of all potential seats here at town meeting. There has been uh, a different interpretation of what is a quorum being 50% plus one of people who've been elected and otherwise appointed and ex officio members. And I anticipate next year we will use that quorum rule. But for today's purposes, we've used 50% uh, of one plus one of all potential members. So to the extent that we would drop below 77 at any point, including during any business, we wouldn't be able to take any further action Moderator recognizes Ian Goodnow for preliminary motion number one. Good morning, RTM. Uh, Ian Goodnow, Chair, Brattleboro Select Board. Uh, I move that the following persons be authorized to remain in the meeting with the Select Board and the Town Meeting members. Town Manager John Potter, Town Attorney Robert Fisher, Assistant Town Manager Patrick Moreland. Is there a second? Mr. Carville seconds. It's been moved and seconded that the following persons be authorized to remain in the meeting with the select board and town meeting members. Town Manager John Potter, Town Attorney Robert Fisher, Assistant Town Manager Patrick Moreland, and Executive Assistant Jessica Stickler. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you've adopted preliminary motion number one. The moderator recognizes Ian Goodnow for preliminary motion number two. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the electronic media and the ASL interpreters be permitted to remain in the meeting. It's been moved and seconded. Who seconded? Mr. Finnegan uh, um, seconded. It's been moved and seconded that the electronic media and ASL interpreters be permitted to remain in the meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted preliminary motion two. Uh, the moderator recognizes Ian Goodnow for article one. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the appointment of Hillary Francis as town clerk be ratified and approved and confirmed for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Is there a second? Aye. Uh, th Mr. Uh, Carville seconds. It's been moved and seconded that the appointment of Hillary Francis as town clerk 
be ratified, approved, and confirmed for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you very much. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you've adopted Article 1. Moderator recognizes Dr. Reichman for Article 2. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Franz Reichsman, District 8. I move that the appointment of Kimberly Frost as town treasurer be ratified, approved, and confirmed for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Stevens seconds. It's been moved and seconded that the appointment of Kimberly Frost as town treasurer be ratified, approved, and confirmed for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you've adopted Article 2. Moderator recognizes Mr. Case for Article 3. Thank you. Peter Case, District 3, I move that the appointment of the firm of Fisher & Fisher Law Offices, PC, as town attorney be ratified, approved, and confirmed for the term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Is there a second? Mr. Carville seconds. It's been moved and seconded that the appointment of the firm of Fisher & Fisher Law Offices, PC, as town attorney be ratified, approved, and confirmed for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. You've adopted Article 3. Moderator recognizes Mr. Quip for Article 4. Thank you. Daniel Quip, uh, District 8. I move that the town auditor's report be accepted as printed in the annual town report and posted on the town's website. Is there a second? Mr. Cook seconds. Um, it's been moved and seconded that the town's auditor's report be accepted as printed in the annual town report and posted on the town's website. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted Article 4. For Article 5, the moderator recognizes Elizabeth McLaughlin. Good morning. Elizabeth McLaughlin, District 9. I move that the town authorize its select board to employ a certified public accountant or public accountants. Is there a second? Mr. Franks. It's been moved and seconded that the town authorize its select board to employ a certified public accountant or public accountants. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted Article 5. For Article 6, the moderator recognizes Ian Goodnow. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the select board be authorized to borrow money in anticipation of taxes, grants, and other revenue. Is there a second? Mr. Carville. Um, it's been moved and seconded that the select board be authorized to borrow money in anticipation of taxes, grants, and other revenue. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you've adopted Article 6. So Article 7 is the bond issue. Polls will open at 10 o'clock, but this is an opportunity for any discussion on this bond article to the extent anybody's got any questions or comments. So, moderator recognizes Mr. Goodnow on Article 7. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. And it's not a motion, so I'm just going to read the article. Um, so, Article 7, 
to see if the town will authorize the following capital improvement to construct the secondary, ple secondary Pleasant Valley water storage tank at an estimated cost of $1,620,000 and will authorize the issuance of notes and or bonds in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $1,620,000 at a rate of interest not to exceed 3% per annum and for term of 10 years to pay to that extent the cost of said public improvement. The vote on this article shall be by Australian ballot as required by law, and the question to be voted upon is as follows. Shall the notes or bonds of the town of Brattleboro in the amount not to exceed $1,620,000 and bearing interest not to exceed 3% be issued for the purpose of constructing the secondary Pleasant Valley water storage tank? As noted by Mr. Goodnow, uh, voting will be by Australian ballot. Polls open at 10 o'clock. Polls close a half hour after this town meeting adjourns. Is there any discussion or any comments about this Article 7, the bond issue? Um, your name, please. Uh, Tony Duncan, District 9. Um, I, I just read through it, and I'm, it, it says that there is a, a loan um, with 0% interest over a 40-year rate, and then it talks about paying off the loan faster. And I, I guess I just don't understand. I mean, personally, I would never do that. It's like if I've got 0%, I would like, well, I'll pay it off as long as it takes. So I assume there's reasoning for that. And I just want to sort of understand more the, the finances of that sort of thing. A member of the administration is interrogated about uh, the timing of payoff of the loan. Yeah, uh, there was some, thank you very much for the question, uh, Tony. Uh, there was discussion at this, at the informational session as well. Um, it's my understanding that the 3%, uh, up to 3% language in the motion uh, is a little dated and that the 0% interest is under the 3%, uh, and so that's why uh, <laughs> Uh, it still works for the motion, but of course we would we want to utilize the zero percent interest. Um, and I think your other question was to the time of payment, um, and I'd look to John if you want to speak to that. Sure. John Potter, town manager. So the uh, the payment schedule has not been worked out by the select board yet they will uh, if, if this is approved they'll uh, they'll figure out what that is there are several options there one is to uh, I believe there's funding in the utility budget already to pay off this loan over uh, over several years two years uh, so that's one option another is to continue on with the zero percent financing for a longer period I believe up to 20 20 years, is it? Uh, I think up to 20 years. So those are the types of things that we would analyze if you want to do this. Mr. Davis. Andrew Davis, District 9. Um, could you just clarify, uh, I'm a water customer is this being paid for by those of us that use town water, or is it being paid for by the, uh, when I look at, there's a mention of user rates in the article, but then there's also a mention of the capital uh, account. Could you clarify who's paying for this? Members Thank you. of administration is interrogated. Thank you, John Potter. Uh, so, the, uh, the utility ratepayers will be paying for this. This is a requirement to go to the bond bank to have town meeting. Uh, it's kind of a backup, I guess, is the way I look at it. So, but there's only if the utility fund defaulted would it ever come back to to the town. So, uh, and we already have the funding in place. So it's it's kind of a um, just just a, a th thing that we have to do. So. It, Uh, well, maybe uh, I could get some help on, on this one. Uh, After the next Dan. question, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll get some further clarification. Thank you. Hi, Aaron Smith, uh, District 7. 
Um, my questions aren't really pertaining to approving the bond, but I had questions about the project itself. Um, the existing tank we have, I guess, was built in the 1980s, and I was just wondering what the lifespan is of a, a tank, first, and second, why for the supplemental tank to be so small in comparison um, if we're able to take advantage of a bond at zero percent interest, is it possible to enlarge the project to have a, our money go further for like protecting against future co collapse of the existing tank? Member of the administration is interrogated. Yes, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to uh, just make sure to say your name. When acknowledge you uh, John Potter. I'd like to acknowledge uh, DPW Director Dan Tyler to answer that question and hopefully uh, expand on my, my answer in the previous question. So Dan Tyler, Department of Public Works uh, Director, will respond to that inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. Yes. Good morning. Um, yes, this is a utility project. It, uh, it, it falls under the utility budget. It'll be paid by the rate payers. Um, the, 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 capital, the capital expense for the project has been incorporated into the capital budget. Um, we have not decided how long we will take to pay this loan, but the money's there. So I guess the point is it's not going to impact rates um, at all. As far as the construction of the tank, the, the, the work that needs to be done to recondition the existing 3 million gallon tank will add an approximate 50 year lifespan to that tank. Um, the reason that this one's as small as it is really is just space. Uh, we looked at options for temporary tanks and this is the more affordable option to to install a permanent tank and its size to do what we need it to do, what's required to keep the uh, plant f running and sending water to town, but we're really limited by space up there. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. I just want to go back and uh, repeat the answer in a little bit shorter form uh, in response to Mr. Davis's question. Town meeting members need to approve the borrowing but the uh, costs of repayment are allocated solely to ratepayers. So that's through the utilities fund only, not the general budget. But we as a group have to approve the borrowing. Are there any further questions or comments on Article 7? Once again, polls will open at 10 o'clock. Polls will close a half hour after the meeting adjourns. Um, on Article 8, moderator recognizes Dr. Reichman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Franz Reichsman, District 8. <clears throat> I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $131,698.86 through special assessments on property within the Mountain Home Special Benefit Assessment Tax District as approved by town meeting March 24, 2007, and as delineated in the town ordinance entitled Municipal Act to Establish and Regulate the Mountain Home Park Special Benefit Assessment Tax District for the purpose of paying debt service on the capital improvements to the water and sewer lines serving the Mountain Home and Deepwood Mobile Home Parks. Is there a second? Ms. Frank seconds. It's been moved and seconded that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $131,698.86 through special assessments on property within the Mountain Home Park Special Benefit Assessment Task District as approved by town meeting March 24, 2007 and as delineated in the town ordinance entitled Municipal Act to establish and regulate the Mountain Home Park Special Benefit Assessment, Assessment Tax District for the purpose of paying debt service on the capital improvements to the water and sewer lines serving the Mountain Home and Deepwood Mobile Home Parks. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you've adopted Article 8. Moderator recognizes Peter Case for Article 9. Thank you, Peter Case, District 8. 
I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $80,000 through special assessments on properties within the Downtown Improvement District as approved by town meeting March 19, 2005, and as delineated in the town ordinance entitled Municipal Act to establish and regulate the Downtown Improvement District to be used for capital and operating costs and of projects of the town's duly designated downtown organization as reflected in its work plan and budget. Is there a second? Ms. Carville seconds. It's been moved and seconded that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $80,000 through special assessments on properties within the downtown improvement district as approved by town meeting March 19, 2005 and as delineated in the town ordinance entitled Municipal Act to establish and regulate the downtown improvement district to be used for capital and operating costs of projects of the town's duly designated downtown organization as reflected in its work plan and budget. Is there a second? Mr. Franks. Is that? Oh, I'm sorry. It was already seconded. Um, is there any discussion? Over here. Kevin O'Brien, District 9. Um, I'd like to learn more about the, the last words, uh, the work plan and budget. Um, so I guess I'm interrogating what, what that means. Thank you. A member of the administration or anybody else on behalf of the Downtown Improvement District is interrogated about the organization's work plan and budget. Does anyone from I'm not. I, uh, Ian Goodenow, uh, I'm not sure if anyone from the DBA is currently here, uh, but so our designated downtown group is the Downtown Brattleboro Alliance, the DBA. They come and present each year uh, on the work that they're doing and on their budget. Um, it uh, is also on page 88 of the um, annual report. Um, and I'm happy to answer more specific questions if I can, and if there is someone from the DBA here, uh, I would uh, ask the moderator to recognize them to speak on it. So reference has been made to page 88 of the town report for the DBA's um, annual report and in part its work plan. Is there anybody else who's available to speak to Mr. O'Brien's inquiry? Ms. O'Connor. I'm Kate O'Connor, District 9. I don't work for DBA, but I was on their board for like 15 years, so I can tell you what, what it's all about. The um, work plan and budget, I think you were talking about, is developed by the Downtown Brattleboro Alliance, and it's voted on, before it gets to the select board, it's voted on by all of the property owners in Downtown Brattleboro who are actually putting the assessment in. So it's been approved by the people that are gonna be taxed and then it goes to the select board to get to us. I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor. Any further questions or comments on Article 9? Yes, Ms. Morgan. Um, this is a question, but I was just wondering, um, I'm looking at the Finance Committee's report about the Community Marketing Initiative, and I noticed that for that um, uh, uh, funding, that it was identified that, that the select board wanted to allocate $160,000 for that purpose. So I was just wondering why um, is that put into the general budget rather than on these assessments um, that's my question. A member of the administration is interrogated about the potential overlap between the DBA funding and the marketing initiative funding. Thank you, Robin, for the question. Uh, so I'm just, and I'm trying to understand the, I'm trying to understand the question to answer it uh, effectively. So uh, the 160 was uh, a request from the DBA. They, they came and presented on the marketing initiative and they, it was a five, five years they had done it and they kind of decided 
Um, they wanted to move in a different direction from the marketing to um, contracting with someone uh, for the DBA who can help them access grants and other funding resources to uh, invest in the downtown. It was uh, essentially a pilot program uh, that was uh, for one year uh, and we, there was some discussion on the board and she indicated, Kate indicated that um, they would probably need another year to really determine how effective it would be and uh, so the board decided to allocate 160 out of the revolving loan fund uh, for the DBA to utilize um, uh, to utilize uh, those funds uh, and then come back to the board after those two years. So um, it's a little different than the marketing initiative. And then as far as the 80,000 for uh, the um, uh, for the uh, designated downtown organization to utilize, that's a special assessment. So it's not it's not revolving loan fund. Revolving loan fund is not coming out of the general fund. So it's not quite overlapping. And I don't know if I've answered that question or not. So I want to note that the inquiry, it turns out, was about a matter separate and apart from what's in Article 9 based upon that response. Um, so uh, theoretically, the inquiry is not germane. I phrased it that way in order to try to get the answer out in relation to the article. But discussion is not going to be had at this time about the money from the revolving loan fund for the marketing initiative. The inquiry is about the um, requested uh, appropriation of $80,000 for the downtown improvement district. Uh, Mr. Frick. Hey, Fr uh, Frick Sprite. Mr. Sprite, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I've not been confused with any of the other Fricks in town yet. Um, <laughs> District 3 squared. Uh, I think the, the clarification is, if I understand correctly, that uh, none of the mon money for the, from the revolving loan fund or from the special assessment district affects any of the rest of us. It's all funds that are we have to approve at town meeting, but it is uh, solely affecting downtown, and uh, the rest of us are not impacted financially. Is that correct? A member of the administration is interrogated to confirm that town meeting members need to approve uh, this appropriation, but that the funds will be raised only from members of the downtown improvement district. That's the question, right? Yes. <laughs> That's right. Are there any other inquiries about Article 9 or any further comments about Article 9? Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 9, please rise and say aye. aye. Thank you. All those opposed to Article 9, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted Article 9. For Article 10, the moderator recognizes Daniel Quip. Daniel Quip, District 8. I'm going to take a sip of water before I begin this one. Oh, quick. Okay, um, I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $367,810 to support human service programs and facilities for the residents of Brattleboro to be allocated among 36 service providers in the following manner. AIDS Projects of Southern Vermont, $2,000. American Red Cross, New Hampshire and Vermont Region, $3,750. Big Brother, Big Sisters, $7,500. Bonnyvale Environmental Education Center, $10,000. Boys and Girls Club, $17,000. Brattleboro Area Hospice, $7,400. Brattleboro Center for Children, $5,400. Brattleboro Housing, Tri Park, $12,000. Brattleboro Senior Meals, $10,000. Building a Positive Community, $4,000. Family Garden, $2,500. Food Connects, $10,000. Gathering Place, $5,000. Green Mountain RSVP, $1,000. Groundworks Collaborative, $20,000.
Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services, $10,000. Meeting Waters YMCA, $10,000. Out in the Open, $16,500. Putney Food Shelf, $4,260. Rich Earth Institute, $1,500. Senior Solutions, $6,000. Sevka, $13,300. Southeastern Vermont Transit, The Mover, $24,000. The Root Social Justice Center, $25,000. Theater Adventure, Inc., $3,000. Turning Point, $25,000. Vermont Adult Learning, $2,400. Vermont Association for the Blind, $700. Vermont Center for Independent Living, $1,600. Vermont Family Network, $2,500. Wyndham County Dental Center, $15,000. Wyndham County Humane Society, $2,000. Wyndham County Safe Place Child Advocacy Center, $15,000. Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, $10,000. Winston Priority Center for Child and Family, $15,000. Women's Freedom Center, $17,500. WSESU uh, -E Summer Food Program, $10,000, and Youth Services, $20,000. Is there a second? Mr. Carville seconds. Thank you. Um, as a general matter, Robert's Rules calls for the motion to be made, then to be read back in full after it's seconded, and then to be read back again before the vote's taken. I'm not going to read back all of the organizations at this time. I will read them again before the uh, vote is taken. But it's been moved and seconded that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $367,810 to support human services programs and facilities for the residents of Brattleboro to be allocated among the 36 service providers in the manner that was just read by Mr. Quip. Is there any discussion? Mr. Davis. Andrew Davis, District 9. Uh, first off, I'd just like to thank our Human Services Committee for all of the hours they have put on this. There was a time when I first became a town rep where these kinds of allocations were discussed from the floor at this meeting. There was a haphazard quality to the uh, process, uh, last-minute requests, and the whole uh, reason the town meeting put forward the Human Services Committee was not uh, to make an opportunity for us to rubber stamp something, but to have a fully rational process for evaluating these requests. I did a little bit of research um, on my own looking at the requests in comparison to some of the budgets of these organizations that are available online through organizations like ProPublica. These requests represent only a portion of these organizations' budgets, in some cases less than 1%, in some cases up to 5%. The town is a partner in supporting and encouraging the many human service organizations in our town. But the town is not a major philanthropic foundation. It's not um, the main source of funding for these organizations. And our human service agencies are funded with multiple sources of income that can include federal and state grants, donations, fundraising, and money from our town. So I would like to just end by saying our committee does a thorough job, public meetings that people can go to, and I fully support the recommendations of the Human Services Committee. Thank you. I want to please... I want to please ask that applause not be made after individual comments. Applause is the flip side of booing, and uh, it's really not an appropriate way. If you have a comment you want to express, please ask to be recognized, and we'll call you to the microphone. Ms. Mnuchin, do you have a comment? Thank you. Uh, 
Abby Manukin, District 8. Um, I want to echo Andy's support for the Human Services Committee and all of the hard work that they did. Um, I will wholeheartedly vote to support this measure, and I want to note that um, they didn't actually f fully fund either the amount that um, town meeting proposed last year at 2%, which I know will be a later item, because agencies didn't actually ask for that full amount in total, and um, because they're really um, thoughtful about how they're um, dispensing these funds. And the application process is very rigorous, and the committee spends so much time on it. And so um, I just think it really shows that um, that they're thoughtful and that this, this money will be accounted for, and it's a transparent process, and I'm, I'm really grateful for everyone. Ms. Garza is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ruben Garza, District 9. Um, I, I'd like to just point out that um, in the article it says 36 service providers um, were granted funding. In fact, 38 were granted funding based on the list. Um, and I know that because 39 um, were 39 applicants, but only 38 were funded. So the article should read 38 service providers. A member of the administration is asked please to count the number of organizations so we get the motion right when it's finally voted on. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Garza. <laughs> yes, over here. Uh, Steve Heim, uh, District 9. I just think it's, it's worth mentioning uh, some of the taxpayers in our town that are probably feeling extremely strapped due to inflation. Uh, and I just want to reiterate that Brattleboro is not a philanthrop <laughs> philanthropic organization, and this sort of takes away uh, a household or an individual's own discretion on uh, what they have to give and where they want to give it. And it just <laughs> it kind of assigns it over to the town. And you take that discretion away from an individual who, uh, or a household who's really struggling uh, in a town with a 27% poverty rate. I, I really think that's, that's something worth considering yeah, in, these, in this budget. Thank you. I'll note in terms of comments relating to this Article 10, there is a separate article to be voted on later at town meeting about the percentage of the FY26 budget to be allocated to human services funding. So if you have comments about that general issue, please would you consider holding those to Article 16? Um, Mr. Morton. This is just a question. I'm not opposed to it, but I noted that Wyndham County Dental Center is getting 15,000. Um, so I'm just looking for an explanation. It seems to be that, that would be a business, but I'm not sure someone can help me with that, if you could. Member of the Human Services Funding Committee is interrogated. Well, thank you, Mr. Minor. David Minor, District uh, 7. Uh, I'm the chair, chair of the Human Services Committee. Uh, the, uh, the dental program is, is uh, one which is largely uh, philanthropic, philanthropic uh, effort and uh, is, uh, has provided, I think, a tremendous service to, to uh, the, re the residents that, uh, that are in most in need of, uh, of dental care and, attempt and appreciate. Thank you, Mr. Miner. Uh, behind Mr. Garza. Yeah. Would you, did you want to respond to that inquiry? I to the no. Are you, okay. Come on. Mary Casey, I guess I'm in District 8 now. I, I hear what you're saying about uh, strapped for money. Part of this, and it drives me nuts too, if you want to um, 
donate to something, why can't you just donate to something? Some of that has to do with the grant procedures that all these nonprofits go through. You have to show individual support and town support. So this is part where they can say, we've asked for a teeny tiny little part of our budget, but they can do the chuck mark <laughs> on, the, on the nonprofit list saying, see my town my town supports me. I hear what you're saying. A part of it, like I say, it's just that grant system. I would ask, please, in the future, that all comments be directed towards the moderator rather than to individual members. Over here, thank you. Uh, Zeke King, District 9. Um, I had a comment that I already had in mind, um, but I'd like to respond to the, um, not directly to, I would like to re share that um, I know about some of the work of the Wyndham County Dental Center. Um, it is extremely difficult to find dental care in this town if you're poor. Um, and dental care is a huge problem, like one in five people over the age of 55 don't have any teeth left in this country, might be 65, but anyway, um, honestly, I think they should be getting more, like, um, because they had, when the last time I tried to get in as a patient, um, a couple of years ago, they were no longer, they didn't even have a waiting list because there is a need that is much greater than they can fill. Um, but I also wanted to respond more generally to human services. Um, I think I made some, I made a, I was expressed um, surprise at the pre-RTM meeting the other week um, that the, amount that some of these human services organizations were getting was so low. Um, Andy explained to me that $20,000 wasn't the entire budget of, entire <laughs> annual operating budget of Groundworks Collaborative, so thanks for that. I, um, <laughs> but no, in general, just um, these organizations are, they could all use so much more money than they're getting here right now. Like HCRS, that's human services, and I, I don't remember the acronym. Anyway, um, HRS, it, it, your case managers have twice the caseload of what would be a, a comfortable caseload for them. I've been the recipient of, of I've been involved with a case manager there who told me they had, yeah, they, they had, it would have 20 to 25 case, uh, people on their caseload would have been more comfortable and they had like over 30, they had like 34 people. They had trouble remembering who said, had said what to them and these See, are like. Your, your comments have exceeded two minutes. If you could please wrap oh, up. Okay, Thank so you. I, I just would like to say that I, would encourage, um, not that more money would necessarily solve problems such as an overwhelming caseload, but in the future I would encourage these organizations to ask for even more from the citizens because I think a lot of people, especially low income people in this town, would prefer that their money goes where it's most needed rather than trying to figure out themselves where the small amount of money that they can give should be allotted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Morgan. This is just a question um, for the <clears throat> select board or, or finance manager. Uh, I was wondering if you could say, what is this amount, $367,810, um, the impact on the tax rate, like could you say it in terms of per $100,000 of home value, what does that add up to? Thank you. Member of the administration is interrogated.
There was th some. Th 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 oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ian Goodnow, District 9. Uh, the uh, uh, Finance Director, Kim Frost, is working on that number. We'll have it for you in one moment. And uh, I want to take the moment just also answer it in percentage. It's 1.73% of uh, the allocated amount that was given to the committee from last year's RTM of 2%. And we'll get the answer for you in one moment. We'll give the answer uh, after this next comment. Yeah, I just want Marta Gossage, District 9. Um, I wanted to clarify specifically the need for the residents of this town for the Wyndham County Dental Clinic. Um, right now, if you're on Medicaid, there, and, uh, there is dental coverage, but the closest dentists that take Vermont Medicaid are like Rutland and something else farther north, and the waiting list can be up to six months. So. Um, Wyndham County Dental Clinic was created to serve the need that we have folks, not only my friends and neighbors, like a single mom with three kids who's on Medicaid and has uh, cavities she can't fill, also our Afghan refugee um, and other um, asylum-seeking friends, and also our homeless population often have um, really bad uh, infections in their mouth, which means they can't get treated for other conditions until they resolve those. Um, so we have people, residents of our town, um, who, need, who are on Medicaid and unable to resolve mouth issues, which as we all know can lead to death. So I find this one particularly important and just wanted to point out again, um, as I did last year, that the human services budget, um, our services provided to residents of this town, it's not um, charity. This is uh, looking at needs in our community and trying to figure out where the town can uh, support those efforts for our residents. Thank you, Ms. Gossage. I want to note that last year inquiries were made about the impact on the tax rate uh, from any given uh, uh, appropriation that's made here at town meeting. And it's a difficult calculation because the final budget is not yet determined and the tax rate is not yet determined. So they're doing their best to come up with that number and hopefully it'll be available and ready before we're ready to vote. Mr. Agave. Yeah, Mr. Agave, Spoon, you. Spoon Agave, District 8. Um, I support this 100%, and, uh, but I would like to, um, uh, I've listened to a lot of the stories of the people that are in need in this town, often horrified about the things that I hear. I would like to comment, this is not uh, any sort of indication or, or suggestion that our town is some sort of a charitable organization. We put this money towards these uses because we care about the people that live in our town. This is not some kind of a, of a handout of, um, this, is, this is a moral obligation that we are fulfilling. And the amount we give sort of represents the amount that we care. I wish it was a lot more. Any further comments? Uh, Pierre Landry, District, District 7. Um, I fully support this article. Um, just one quick question I have. I noticed that uh, the Southeast Vermont Transit Mover is a new, new uh, recipient of, of money at $24,000. My question is, um, how is the mover generally funded? Um, does the town support it? In their in the regular budget, their you know the town budget as well as this uh, human services article. That's my question. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Uh, Mr. Quip is recognized. Um, Mr. Moderator, town meeting. I, I just want to kind of refer to the fact that there are human service narratives from pages 74 onwards uh, in your report, and I do not work for the mover and. I can tell you from having read this that it says that they requested funds 
to start a new free micro transit service in Brattleboro. Some of you may have read about that in the last couple of days. Um, and I believe that was the reason for their request. The funding for the mover is from lots of different places. Brattleboro does uh, contribute some through our general fund. That details in here as well. Generally, a member wouldn't be heard for a second time, but Mr. Lane, if you're following up on your inquiry, please continue. Just clarification. Landry, I'm um, sorry. I believe that, oh, Pierre Landry, um, District 7. Uh, just for clarification, I thought I read that the new microbus was going to be funded by BCDD or BDCC. If there's anybody who's in attendance who can speak to the inquiry about the funding for the new microbus, whether it's being funded by BDCC and other funding, that's the nature of the inquiry. Ms. Fillion may have an answer. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sue Fillion. I am a board member of Southeastern Vermont Transit. Um, the new microtransit service does have funding from BDCC. It's for $100,000. It's from um, Northern Borders Coalition, or the Northern, Northern Borders um, Regional Planning Committee, or Regional Commission. Um, that funding will, it's a, this is a pilot project. That funding goes uh, through kind of the end of the year. This an additional request of 24,000 is to extend it a little bit further. Thank you, Ms. Fillion. Mr. Moderator, uh, if I may, I can answer the previous question. Ms. Goodnow was interrogated about the impact on the tax rate of this human services funding. Thank you very much. So the question was, what was the impact on the tax rate for the proposed amount in Article 10? It would be per 100,000. $31.40, uh, and I just want to uh, express my appreciation to Kim and Patrick coming up with that number really quickly. They want to get it as accurate as possible, but I will put an asterisk next to every time we answer this question for you that they are making a couple of assumptions to uh, you know, get an accurate number, so it's as close as we possibly can, and I appreciate their their desire to be as accurate as possible, which is always why there's a delay in getting that answer. So thank you both very much. Sarah Turbo, District 9. I'm a member of the Human Services Committee. I want to speak to the mover question. just want to draw everyone's attention to page 20 of the um, report. <clears throat> and I'll read this, this paragraph. With regards to the application submitted by the Southeast Vermont Transit, also known as the Mover, the committee passed a proposal to fully fund their proposed transportation pilot program as requested for this year only. Because the committee feels that ongoing funding of essential town services, for example, public transportation, is outside of the traditional human services funding scope of the committee, it encourages the Mover to pursue other funding sources for ongoing essential services beyond this year. So we decided to fund this because we believe that it was a good and useful human service project um, as a pilot, and they were requesting funding to try this pilot, but we did feel that moving forward, they should be looking for funding sources from the town directly um, through other sources, and through other sources. Thank you. Any further comments? Mr. Tewksbury. Captain Tewksbury, District 8, I just wanted to uh, say that the uh, amount we allocated, that what they requested was a match for, the, for state funding they had. So in order to get any funding, they needed a match. And so they applied to us as well as other sources. And that was also part of our consideration, as well as limiting it to just this year. Thank you, Mr. Tewksbury. I know it's sort of odd to be talking to me when everybody's behind you, but the microphones are set up to be able to um, speak to the camera. So if you really want to speak to the group, then turn the microphone around so everybody can hear you. Any further comments? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $367,810 
to support human services programs and facilities for the residents of Brattleboro to be allocated among how many? Uh, yes, we did the count and we were wrong. It was 38, not 35. Among 38 service providers, I'll assume that that motion is amended by unanimous consent? Yes. In the following manner, AIDS Project of Southern Vermont, $2,000. American Red Cross, New Hampshire and Vermont Region, $3,750. Big Brothers, Big Sisters, $7,500. Bonnie Vale Environmental Education Center, $10,000. Boys and Girls Club, $17,000. Bradbury Hospice, $7,400. Brattleboro Center for Children, $5,400. Brattleboro Housing Tri-Park, $12,000. Brattleboro Senior Meals, $10,000. Building a Positive Community, $4,000. Family Garden, $2,500. Food Connects, $10,000. Gathering Place, $5,000. Green Mountain RSVP, $1,000. Groundworks. I timed out. <laughs> Groundworks, it's the first time this meeting. Groundworks Collaborative, $20,000. HCRS, $10,000. Meeting Waters YMCA, $10,000. Out in the Open, $16,500. Putney Food Shelf, $4,260. Rich Earth Institute, $1,500. Senior Solutions, $6,000. Sevka, $13,300. Southeastern Vermont Transit, The Mover, $24,000. The Root Social Justice Center, $25,000. Theater Adventure, Inc., $3,000. Turning Point, $25,000. Vermont Adult Learning, $2,400. Vermont Association for the Blind, $700. Vermont Center for Independent Living, $1,600. Vermont Family Network, $2,500. Wyndham County Dental Center, $15,000. Wyndham County Humane Society, $2,000. Wyndham County Safe Place Child Advocacy Center, $15,000. Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, $10,000. Winston Prouty Center for Children and Family, $15,000. Women's Freedom Center, $17,500. WSESU Summer Food Program, $10,000. And Youth Services, $20,000. Are you ready for that question? All those in favor, please rise and say aye. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted Article 10. On Article 11, Ms. McLaughlin is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the compensation of the select board chairperson be set at $10,000 and that the salaries of the other members of the select board be set at $8,000 each. Is there a second? Ms. Melton seconds. It's been moved and seconded that the compensation of the select board chair be set at $10,000 and the salaries of the other members of the select board be set at $8,000 each. Is there a discussion? Hello, my name is Cyrus Smith. I am from District 7. Um, and my inquiry is um, how much of their time is dedicated to select board duties? How much time? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm member sorry. Of the administration, uh, a member of the select board is interrogated. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't catch your name. Smith. Smith. Cyrus. Iris. Thank you very much for the question. I anticipated this uh, question and spent a bunch of time thinking about it and still didn't come up with a really good answer. Um, I can speak as the chairperson. You, uh, there are a lot of things that happen during the week, uh, and it can really vary in the time. Um, the chair and the vice chair, uh, who's Franz this year, uh, have a separate meeting called the agenda setting meeting. That can go from 30 minutes to two hours, depending on how much material there is. Uh, and then, as far as the chairperson goes, it's a lot of answering emails and answering questions from uh, members of the public, which is something I love to do, but like it is part of the job. Uh, and then it's uh, answering media inquiry, uh, talking with the town manager about um, various things going on in the town, emergencies, non-emergencies, uh, and then obviously the select board meetings themselves, which um, if you have been a, a, a watcher of my time on the board, uh, I haven't done a great job of keeping them short, uh, so they go 
pretty late. And I, I, I'm hesitant to give you an exact number because it really does vary from week to week. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope that that helps to give you at least a sense for, I can, I'm only speaking from really the chair's perspective from the last two years, um, but I would say it varies from, if it's a week with uh, an agenda setting meeting plus a select board meeting, uh, plus answering the things I was talking about, it's probably vary from five, uh, five hours to 10, I'd say. Uh, but again, that's a real estimate. Uh, yeah, and I, and I would really give, I'd love to, if the moderator would be agreeable, I'd love to give other board members an opportunity to speak to that. Other board members, select board members are interrogated. Uh, Liz? Uh, that's not my meeting. I just wanted to add that uh, Thursday's meeting uh, we had an executive session at 5, and we wrapped up early. I got home at 9.15, so that's four hours, and that was a short meeting. Um, most of the time, they go to 10 or 11. And so that's just the meeting. But I also spend a lot of time discussing uh, town matters with the town manager and other members of the staff and other members of the select board. So. I don't have a, a tally of what that is, but it's considerable. Mr. Carville. George Carville District, West Brattleboro. Um, is the number proposed the same as last year, or is it different? It's, oh. Yes, the number is the same as last year, rather than interrogating somebody. Any other inquiries? Well, it's been moved and seconded that the compensation of the select board chair be set at $10,000. Salaries of the other members of the select board be set at $8,000 each. Are you ready for that question? Well then, all those in favor, please rise and say aye. 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 Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted Article 11. Article 12, moderator recognizes Mr. Goodnow. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. In good now, District 9, uh, I move that the town transfer, transfer from the unassigned general fund balance the sum of $268,862 to be used for street paving and other capital road improvement projects. Is there a second? Mr. Stroud, second. Um, it's been moved and seconded that the town transfer from the unassigned general fund balance the sum of Two hundred sixty-eight thousand eight hundred and sixty-two dollars to be used for street paving and capital road improvement projects. Is there discussion, Mr. O'Brien? Kevin O'Brien, District Nine. Um, I'd like to interrogate how the decision of allocation comes about. About. About these funds, where these funds get spent, do they go to DPW every year, et cetera? Oh, where are you? What's it? Yeah, I got it first. Mr. Goodnow is interrogated. I only have so many times I can answer questions left, so. Uh, yeah, uh, I will, and I'll leave it to DPW well, as well if they want to answer. But generally speaking, transfer from unassigned general fund as a matter of course should go towards one time investments in improvements because. It's, left, it's leftover funds that we didn't, uh, aren't budgeted for, and we don't want to take those funds and put them into uh, things that we use on a, a yearly basis for operations, because we don't want to get in a place where we're using the unassigned fund balance uh, towards operations and then some year not have any. And then suddenly we're having to raise the tax rate because we've become dependent on those unassigned. So as far as, a, uh, I think generally speaking, that's the methodology is that we invest these funds back into capital improvement projects because those are things that we're always going to need to continue to do, but they are not a base operations uh, 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 number. And I hope that answers your question, but I see you coming back up. <laughs> yes. Mr. O'Brien, are you also inquiring about specific projects? No, this is a, a clarification as who makes the decision and, and when that time comes about. Is, is it the, at a select board meeting? Well, you're going to make the decision a little bit tonight, or today, uh, but it's also the select board makes that decision during the budgeting process. 
Okay, so this happens during, during the budgeted process, and then, then this article comes about, and then we vote on it today. Yes, uh, and I see Fr Franz, you. Uh, Franz Reichsman, District 8. Uh, the, the amount is uh, in large part just a mathematical calculation. It's what's left over in the budget after the year's business is completed, and this money hasn't been spent. Um, so there's no requirement to spend all of it, but the, we, we of, of the amount that we have in the bank, we always keep 10% of the annual budget for emergency spending, and then anything over that 10% is considered unassigned fund balance. And that's the amount that goes into this determination um, so that we looked at that number in deciding how, how much is available um, and then make a recommendation to you to see if you agree with that. Certainly. So, and I guess the, so this came about to allocate the funds to, to DPW from a request of theirs, or was that a select board um, decision? I don't know if that's a clarifying question, and if I'm allowed to ask it at this point. You're yeah. allowed to ask any question. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Whether it's in order, it's a different <laughs> issue. Whether it can be answered is a different yeah, issue. Yeah, that's the question, if we can answer it. Uh, Liz? Is it? I, uh, Mr. O'Brien, it's, it's a chicken and egg question that you're asking because uh, the public works, we're always on the psych board well aware of the demands for rate, road paving and a certain amount is budgeted every year in part of the budget. But additional funds are welcome to catch up uh, to the maintenance of our roads and sidewalks because um, it is a little overwhelming and we cannot devote you know, as much money as would be required to fix all the roads. So it is on a timed basis and a scheduled basis. Um, so this is a, a little extra push. Certainly, yeah, that, that's I'm helpful. also gonna I'm also gonna refer, please, to pages 109 to 110 of your town report, where we have the FY25 capital fund budget and then the capital plan for the next five years, because that is developed out over time uh, by DPW in conjunction with Select Board and Finance Department. Perfectly, thank you. And I guess uh, one last clarifying thing for this moment is um, Ian stated that these were funds generally set aside for a capital project, but Elizabeth, you mentioned that the roads seems like an ongoing maintenance thing, um, and I would, uh, be in the position to say that I think those are two very different different things ongoing maintenance versus the, this capital project I guess that's my, a, a comment thank you sounds like that last one's a comment um, if the select board wants to respond I again, administration. I'll, I'll try not to speak too much today uh, yeah capital maintenance capital improvements to roads is a little different than um, going in and doing the maintenance that's required like every year in springtime. Uh, the projects that we're talking about are more of those like larger scale repavings on roads that need to be done. Um, at least that's my understanding. Um, but I think your point's well taken. Um, and I think that the board can consider that in the future as far as like, are we making sure that these uh, unassigned general fund balance monies are going towards those types of projects and not more of the yearly maintenance stuff? The polls are open on Article 7, so you're free to go vote. Mr. Morton. A uh, question related to uh, the use of the funds. Um, I noticed that these uh, work was done this last year or so, realigning the traffic flow on High Street, left and right, right and left. And I just wonder how that's working out. Whether you, whether you regret doing that or not, if you think it's been a beneficial, and if it's been beneficial, you know, in a way, but if you regret doing it, are you gonna put it back the way it was 
and is that part of what this expenditure might do? Uh, I don't know if that's germane or not, but I just want to ask the question. <laughs> well, it's not really germane. Um, my recommendation would be that um, <coughs> if there's an inquiry about whether the maze on Western Avenue um, was a good idea, that maybe it should be taken up at a select board meeting. Yeah, I think I, I would take, I'd love to take a lot of time to talk about that right now, but I, I don't think it's going to be a germane. Mr. Davis. All right. Right. Anybody have a question that's not about the way Western Avenue is situated? <laughs> Mr. Landry. Pierre Landry, District 7. Just want to get total clarification on the expenditure of these funds. Um, I'm all in favor for paving roads and improving sidewalks. This money is not going to be spent on, like, the ARPA projects redoing intersections at Green Street or at the Creamery Bridge. Okay. Member of the administration is interrogated. Uh, John Potter, town manager. No, that, that, those are separate projects that you're referring to. This funding will go to the long-term capital maintenance of uh, existing roads and sidewalks. Mr. Davis. Arthur D Davis, District 8. I um, guess I'd just like to interrogate member of the administration or uh, director of DPW um, to talk about um, these kinds of funds in terms of their use for um, not just street paving for cars, but um, kind of thinking holistically about our streets in terms of pedestrians and bicyclists. Member of the administration or DPW is uh, interrogated about these funds uh, uh, taking account of bike ped safety. Uh, Mr. Tyler is recognized. Um, yes, the when we take these funds, we, we recently completed a pavement assessment of the town roads. Um, so we're looking at condition of roads, we're looking at um, other projects that may be taking place in the utility projects, state projects, um, under other funding sources. And we're also looking at the various plans that the town has, the bike ped plan. Um, so, you know, the idea is that as we select roads, we'll implement bike and pedestrian improvements as we can. Um, it, we found through Western Avenue that it works best to implement these things on a new, fresh road, blank canvas, um, and that's the hope. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. Mr. Agave is recognized. Spoon Agave, District 8. Um, I uh, very much support the people before me that have pointed out that uh, GASPI, the uh, Standards Board, uh, strongly recommends that uh, excess unreserved money be used for capital projects and not uh, daily operations. Uh, what happens when you use it for operations? If there's no extra next year, then operations become more expensive then. There is no, there is no savings here. We are just spending. And, uh, and that money, uh, I'm, I'm going to vote no on this to, uh, to, so we can just leave that money in the town accounts. And then I hope that next year, the board will bring to this body a recommended policy about how to deal with the excess unreserved funds so that it doesn't become, which it already has become about halfway, a slush fund to apply um, anywhere that seems uh, uh, preferable. And uh, I don't want to have to be arguing every year about where to apply this money. There should be a policy, not a guideline, that uh, we can understand and justify where this money is going. Is there any further discussion on Article 12? Mr. O'Brien. Uh, 
I'd like to propose, oh, Kevin O'Brien, District 9, propose an amendment to Article 12 to see if the town will transfer the full amount of the unassigned general fund balance into the Global Warming Solutions Fund. Um, that amendment is not germane. The article as written speaks to spending a certain amount of money um, being about 10% of the unassigned fund balance, as I understand it, for a specific purpose, street paving and capital road improvements, and an amendment to spend the whole unassigned fund balance, about 10% of the annual budget, for a different purpose um, is not germane, and the moderator rules that amendment out of order. Germain means that the, um, in this context, germane means that the amendment needs to relate to and uh, carry forward the uh, article as warned because members of the public as a whole have the right to expect that the business that will be conducted here at town meeting is as warned in the article, not on unrelated matters. It might be appropriate to have a, a, a article during other business, which is not binding, to make a recommendation that the unassigned fund balance be spent that way in whole, but that uh, a particular amendment would not be germane to this specific uh, article as presented. You can appeal my ruling. Uh, that's the way the system works. Mr. Franks, you can appeal the moderator's ruling. Mr. O'Brien, you've already spoken twice. Um, um, Mr. Franks. Tom Franks, District 9. Uh, just, uh, might have, I might have missed something. I understood Mr. O'Brien to ask that, we, that the unassigned fund balance, the, the amount of over, which is that over the 10% in reserve, be transferred to a different use. And so the moderator's decision if I understand, is that the different use, that, that it's a different use makes it not germane. The amount stays the same. It, 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 we're not, is that correct? I just, want, just clarification. If I misheard, uh, and he was asking for the amount over the ten thousand dollars to be tran to, over the ten percent to be transferred to that purpose, I am corrected. Uh, but my uh, the moderator's ruling remains the same about whether that's germane. But thank, thank you. you for the clarification, Mr. Franks. Is there any further discussion on Article Twelve as presented? Yes. Um, Is that Mr. Heller? Mr. Heller. Thank you. Oscar Heller, District 9. I'm just confused at this point. So just to clarify, the, the most recent thing you said, is the amendment out of order because it didn't use the exact same number as before? And he said, you know, the, so you're saying that it is out of order to change the words street paving improvements to the words Global Warming Solutions Fund, basically, because it would alter the motion too substantially. The moderator ruled that the proposed amendment was not germane and therefore was out of order because it sought to achieve an objective that was not warned and was not publicly noticed. So this article, as warned, requested allocation of 268,000 and change from the unassigned fund balance for street paving and capital improvements. A request to allocate other money from the unassigned fund balance for another purpose was not publicly warned and therefore is not properly considered under binding business, whether it's the entire fund balance or any amount over the 10%. It might properly be considered under other business for that to be a request to be considered at a later date, but it's not properly here because your neighbors didn't know that that was gonna be decided here today. Gotcha, I think I see where you're coming from on that. So 
for information for someone who wanted to achieve as close as they could to the intent of that amendment, they would vote no on this article and then propose something in other business. Um, I, I'm only asking no, no, because procedurally I, this stuff can be very confusing and people may end up feeling that they just don't know how to act. I think that there are a number of um, uh, clarifications I would need to make to your proposed okay. uh, method of proceeding. First of all, there's been no indication that this $268,000 is the amount in excess of the 10 percent. I believe it is a, from the informational meeting. That's my understanding is that it's But that's not been uh, uh, set forth here. Okay. Uh, this is a dollar amount. Right. So um, to the extent that one would like to see the amount in excess of 10 percent of the unassigned fund balance put towards global warming fund or action to take that step to achieve that as a binding action, one would approach the select board during budget season and request for that action to be taken, or one could proceed under the uh, provisions in the charter relating to getting an article on the warning for binding action. Right. That's to have that as binding action. If one wants to have that preference communicated as a non-binding matter, please make the motion during other business and we'll take it up if we've still got a quorum and we haven't adjourned. Right, okay, thank you. I just hate seeing people come up here and then walk away possibly looking saddened. Okay, good, thank you. I don't want to see anybody get sad. Uh, Mr. Oser. Robert Ozer, District 9. I don't know if this is going to help or not, but um, maybe, maybe it's a question, maybe it's a suggestion, maybe it's my thinking about an amendment. But to take that uh, $68,862 to be used for street paving and capital improvement projects, capital road improvement projects, and to be used, and maybe we interrogate someone from DPW, and that that money be used in a certain way that it would not contribute to climate change, that it would be used to control flooding activity, would be used in a manner that's sensitive to those objectives, which may be the intent of the movement of that money into global warming solutions. So I don't know if that's really just a question for information or me thinking about a possible amendment. I think in either instance, the moderator's ruling would be that that's not germane. Okay. Um, once again, um, if, the, if the warning is to buy a dump truck and we want to change it to uh, a dump truck that does certain things or to buy a grader, that's not germane. We can change the dollar amount, but not the objective of the article uh, through an amendment. Mr. Davis, I hope everybody understands. That's, the goal, the goal is to make sure that everybody in town has notice of what we're doing here today. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Arthur Davis, District 8. Um, just to explain myself a little bit um, in my, with my, my previous interrogation of um, DPW, um, I, um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the way that DPW is looking at Capitol Road improvement projects is thinking about um, the multiple ways in which people move around town, um, whether that's walking, bicycling, or sometimes driving, you know? Um, and I think that uh, that is, to me, a hopeful thing. And um, I, don't, I don't see that we are going to um, stop paving our streets anytime soon. And so the thing for me, that I think um, uh, makes, you know, spending money on this kind of thing, on capital road improvements, uh, forward looking is thinking about it as a, that, that we as a town and our town staff are looking at this as a holistic way um, that is not just car centric, so. Dr. Tortolani. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bob Tortolani, uh, District 8. Uh, I'm going to vote in favor of this. Um, I want to thank the Department of Public Works for the work they do. It's extremely important. And I just want to bring to everybody's attention an incredibly uh, large uh, increase in the number of pedestrian deaths that have occurred nationally between, the t between about 4 and 8 p.m. and 8 p.m. No one can quite understand it, but it's happening nationally. And as we know, we have a lot of problems in our own town with uh, pedestrian injuries and deaths over the last five or so years. Uh, and I think we should all be aware of that. And the Department of Public Works efforts to keep lines in the road and crosswalks and flashing lights, I think those are all extremely important. And I just want everybody to be aware, be careful walking and driving, watching for pedestrians between 4 and 8, and of course, all times. But it's a particularly bad at that time. Just be aware of it. Thank you. Mr. Heller is recognized again on this question. Thank you, Oscar Heller, District 9. After thinking about it, and while taking no position on the merits of the amendment, I would like to appeal the moderator's decision on the basis that I think the plain reading of the article is essentially to decide what to do with the excess fund balance. And I think changing how the excess fund balance is spent does not transform the motion in the way that it would if I said, I want to amend the text of the amendment to be, I want to introduce a resolution in support of more, you know, high school sports. That would be clearly improper, but I think changing what we do with the money would be clear enough to someone who read the warning, so I'd like to appeal. Thank you. Uh, I will note that Robert's rules say the appeal needs to be taken immediately from the moderator's ruling. Um, we will um, um, have the appeal if there's a second. second. All right. It's been moved and seconded that the, um, that the moderator's ruling um, be appealed. Now, I want to make sure that we have exactly the language of the amendment um, for the record. So, Mr. O'Brien, if you would please restate um, the amendment. The amendment should have been made in writing. But go ahead, please. If you would please write it out and provide it to the moderator. Write the, mod write the amendment out, please. In this moment. Perfect.
saying this drops by now if we put it somewhere in the upper. Or if this stays the same, we need to raise down. Hold on. So all you want to do is to we pay strike out the word street paving and capital room program project. Okay. Global warming so you put there. I just want to make sure it's, it's to strike out such two words. So um, I'm going to clarify that that's the nature of the name. And you're telling me it's just to strike out the street paving and capital improvements to global warming. Okay, very good. That's fine. Very good. Very good. Yep. By virtue of this argument, yes. Yeah. That, that's what it does. <laughs> the language of the amendment has been submitted. It's somewhat different from as originally proposed, but um, without objection, we're going to accept this amendment. It's to strike out the words street paving and capital road improvement projects and to substitute in its place the words um, to be transferred into the Global Warming Solutions Fund. So the moderator's ruling remains the same as before, that striking out to be used for street paving and capital road improvements projects and substituting in its place the words to be transferred into the Global Warming Solutions Fund is not a germane amendment. There's been a appeal and a second from the moderator's ruling that that's not germane, so let me explain the procedure that will unfold going forward. Um, the moderator will explain the basis for the ruling that uh, that proposed amendment is not germane. We'll have discussion about uh, whether that uh, ruling by the moderator was correct. The moderator will then uh, have the opportunity to repeat uh, the basis for the ruling and then the uh, vote on the appeal will be in the form of will the moderator's ruling um, that that amendment is not germane, be sustained. And um, those in favor will vote aye, those opposed will vote nay, and a majority is needed to overrule uh, the moderator's ruling. So as noted, the uh, purpose of uh, the principle of something being germane in the context of um, these articles is that action taken uh, by town meeting needs to be on matters that are warned um, so that the public has uh, full notice of the matters that are uh, um, being acted on at town meeting. It would not be germane if the select board has put an article on the warning to buy a dump truck to then change that to a grader because the public did not have notice. Your neighbors did not know that we were going to be voting on buying a grader. Uh, they had noticed that we were going to be voting on whether to buy a dump truck. Um, the public had noticed through the article that a request was being made to allocate $268,862 to street paving and capital road improvement projects. And they did not have notice that a request was being made to transfer this money into the, quote, Global Warming Solutions Fund. 
So as a result, the moderator has ruled this. This is not germane, being not properly warned without notice to the public. If, Mr. Uh, moderator, any... point of order. Ms. Dr. Reichman, point um, of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I, I don't know whether the appeal of your ruling is debatable or not by the body. I'm confident that it is, but I'll go back and check. I'd ask Mr. Fisher also to... <laughs> it is debatable. Thank you. Is there any discussion about the appeal of the moderator's ruling. Mr. Sprite. Frick Sprite, District 9. Um, I, I think there's possibly more explanation of the processes in, in order. I was expecting a little bit more. Uh, so my understanding is that we are going to uh, have the opportunity to appeal this after which, if uh, the moderator does not prevail, then we will vote on uh, whether to make, to uh, uh, agree to that amendment, and then after that, vote on uh, approving the article as amended or not amended. Is that correct? I would agree that uh, at this time, the procedural posture is that the moderator has ruled that that's not a proper amendment to be considered. Um, if that vote, if that ruling is uh, found to be uh, incorrect, then discussion would turn to the substance of the proposed amendment, and then the body would have the opportunity to try to amend that once more, um, and then we would have a vote on that amendment. And this is a majority vote? Was that? It's just a majority vote? Yes. Okay. Ms. Franks. I think it's majority. Straight majority. I'm confident straight majority. I've checked it out this morning. <laughs> Mr. Franks. Tom Franks, District 9. I would benefit if the town attorney wishes uh, to be inter interrogated to, for an opinion on exactly how much language can change in a motion for it to remain germane. Uh, one interpretation of this motion would be that we're assigning the, uh, a certain amount to a purpose that is capital use. Um, and if that's... <laughs> If that's not it, I'd just like to hear the town attorney, if willing. Town attorney is interrogated about uh, application of Robert's rules about whether uh, this is a germane amendment. As Bob Fisher, town attorney, uh, with regard to the moderator's ruling, it is, I agree with his ruling with regard to the fact that this was the, what is proposed in the amendment was not warned. And I'll give you an example. If you had an article that the select board put on your warning that says, what shall we do with the excess fund balance? And it was just a broad question. Then I think the proposed amendment and many like it are probably uh, a, a bit of a free for all in terms of going forward uh, with motions to amend and then motions to amend again, et cetera. But because this was specifically warned for this purpose, uh, I believe the moderator's decision is correct. And obviously, it can be appealed. And if the body doesn't sustain that, then it goes forward as, as an amendment. Um, and I would just note if you, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but if if the moderator's decision is sustained and this article gets voted down, that money just remains as fund balance. And then at next year's representative town meeting, uh, that fund balance is then voted upon uh, again. 
and I would then encourage everybody to go to the select board meetings next year to figure out what the particular article should be as far as the assignment of that uh, excess fund balance. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? So the protocol provides that the moderator explains once more. I'll just say that it's not a question whether I think it's a good or a bad idea, whether the moderator thinks it's a good or a bad idea. The question is whether the public had notice that this question was going to be voted on here at town meeting. Um, and that's the basis for the moderator's ruling. Um, the question before the body is whether the moderator's ruling that the proposed amendment is not germane should be sustained. All those in favor of sustaining the moderator's ruling, please rise and say aye. Thank you. All those opposed to sustaining the moderator's ruling, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and the moderator's ruling has been sustained. We're back to the continuing question, which is the motion on Article 12, that the town transfer from the unassigned general fund balance the sum of $268,862 to be used for street paving and capital road improvement projects. Is there any further discussion? Um, Ms. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'd just like to add information to this conversation. Uh, the House just passed a transportation bill. It's gone to the Senate, so it's not completely done yet, but it um, mandates that any town municipal project needs to incorporate complete streets principles in it. Complete streets principles meaning that you need to think about every user of the transportation system. So in a paving project, needs to be thinking about um, pedestrians or bicyclists or who's using the, the road. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation that it seems like some of these uh, capital projects could and actually may need to incorporate these, these principles that we're talking about anyway. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Carville. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. George Carville, West Brattleboro. Uh, my sense is that this meeting might like to see this money used for something else. And it appears to me that the way to accomplish that is to vote no on this article, leaving the money unspent, and then we can discuss with the board how it should be spent. Mr. Sprite. Frick Sprite, District 9. Um, I, I uh, would like to take issue with the moderator about whether I'm uh, uh, inquiring of the um, town as to what specifically the money might be used for and whether it was going to serve the um, broader purpose that uh, obviously a number of people have concerns about. Um, I, I would like to interrogate the, the whoever um, knows about how the, the money is, uh, what projects it's being planned for, and uh, how it might address the concerns that have been raised. Mr. Sprite, I want to make sure that I understand the nature of the inquiry. Uh, are you asking for a specific inventory? of projects that will be funded with the $268,000? With, with an eye towards how that would address uh, perhaps bicycling, pedestrians, how it might affect uh, <laughs> uh, the broader subject of global warming in the context of taking care of our streets. I guess that Mr. Tyler is interrogated about the extent to which the specific projects within the $268,000 um, take account for bicycle pedestrian safety. I think that's the nature of the inquiry. Yeah, if I'm I incorrect, Mr. Sprite, correct me. Mr. Tyler's interrogated. So we're currently still planning, um, you know, 
next year VTrans is planning on a class one paving project that will include um, all the class one routes in town. Um, so our eye this year is really to prepare for that project. Um, we're looking at connecting streets, um, connecting sidewalks, um, you know, various projects throughout town. Um, there's also class two grant funding available for the state, through the state, so we're gonna apply for that. Um, that specifically has to be used on class two roads, so if that's successful, you know, we'll, we'll steer towards um, some of those projects. Um, it, it's, there's an array of projects, there's a long list of projects we're looking at, um, and, you know, we need to wait and see if this budget passes before we can finalize that list. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. Is there a follow-up for Mr. Sprite? If, you, if there is, you should speak to the microphone, please. Hi. I heard nothing about uh, bicycle or pedestrian safety or um, access in your response. Sure. So much of the pedestrian safety, I think, probably falls under sidewalks, right? So there's a separate capital line item for sidewalk improvements. Um, we're, again, looking at sections along the Class 1 routes that need improvement there. Um, and as far as street paving goes, I think we, like Molly mentioned, there's the complete street programs. We look at all of our projects at, through a lens of how we can improve, um, whether it's bike lanes, signage, you know, it, it really depends on the street and what the infrastructure allows. Um, we consult the plans. Um, we have a series of projects that are in the design phase with some consultants. So um, I, I think all the projects, there's, a, there's an eye for improving bike and pedestrian safety. Any bike paths in the mix? Uh, not specifically, no. Okay. Years ago, we voted $50,000 to put a bike path by the uh, Whetstone, which never happened. And so I have a historical frustration with the... Uh, uh, Mr. Sprite, the, anyway. the comments really need to be directed to the moderator and to the group as a whole. Are there any further comments? Ms. Carville. It is. George Carville, West Brattleboro. Mr. Moderator, I, uh, I sense here a uh, feeling that people want more say in how this money gets spent, uh, but that's not possible in this amendment. I move to amend the article downward to $135,000. Is there a second? It's been uh, seconded by Mr. Grace. It's been moved and seconded that Article 12 be amended from $268,862 to $135,000. Is that the right number? The discussion is now on the Carville Amendment to uh, amend down the amount to be spent on street paving and capital road improvement projects from $268,000 to $135,000. Is there any discussion? Um, Mr. Carville, having made the motion, uh, can speak to it first. Thank you. I just uh, I cut the amount in half with the anticipation that uh, we'll all have to talk to the selectmen and talk about how else we might want to spend this money and have it on the warning next year. Mr. Davis. Andrew Davis, District 9. Um, yeah, this is on the amendment. Part of what's uh, hard for me to decide on cutting these funds is not being exactly sure how much of this um, is maintenance and how much of it is capital improvements. Um, we've tried to get specifics on what capital improvements, but I'm wondering just a rough percentage from the Department of Public Works of this original amount was for maintenance, and we know that maintenance is ongoing pressure, and how much was for longer-term capital improvements, a rough percentage of the original amount, and how cutting it in half would affect that spending. So either a member of the administration uh, or the department has, is interrogated about what percentage of the $268,000 originally part of Article 12 was for uh, matters that can generally be characterized as maintenance as opposed to long-term improvements, if that's possible. 
So I, I, the recent um, roadway assessment recommends a funding level of $700,000 a year to maintain the current um, condition of our roadways, which they rated as a 62 out of 100. Um, you know, to improve, to improve that, um, obviously we need more, upwards of a million dollars to increase, uh, to improve the condition. So, you know, at our current funding levels, we're getting to these roads once every 20, 30 years. Um, so I guess if you look at it that way, it's a long-term capital expense. We're not gonna be back in a long time. A lot of what these roads need is maintenance too. So I don't have an exact breakdown, um, but you know, we try to balance it. We, bottom line is, is we're, I don't think we have enough money now. So, you know, we're trying to do the best we can with what we have and balance maintenance and long-term improvements. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. The uh, continuing discussion is on the Carville Amendment to reduce the amount of money allocated for street paving and capital road improvements uh, from 268 to $135,000. Are there further comments? Ms. Atkinson. Margaret Atkinson, District 8. Um, a question for the select board. When you have um, an unexpected e expense that comes up during the year and you need to fix it now, you have total discretion, am I right, over spending money out of the undesignated fund balance, correct? If I may, Mr. Monterey. Select board members interrogated. It depends on when. So if it's before June 30th, then yes. If it's after June 30th and becomes unassigned general fund balance, we need to go to RTM. Okay. So um, in just considering this Is amendment, if you reduce the, um, this unassigned fund balance number by half, that, that other half, there's no guarantee that it's going to be spent the way this body may advise. And if, I, if I may, I think uh, Attorney Fisher spoke to this briefly. Um, if the uh, body voted this article down or voted to amend for it to be less than the amount here, that uh, leftover would go back into the general, uh, unassigned general fund balance and sit there for a year until we got back to RTM with the additional general unassigned fund balance that came from this next year. Um, if you have it. If, yeah. yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes, I, I think it's, I think, you know, what I'm trying to tease out here is the process to decide what dollars get spent on what is, you know, is done back in October, November, December. Um, and so how, whatever we decide about this money, whatever's left over is gonna sit in the bank account for a year unless there's some disaster that before June, July 3rd, correct? Yes. Member okay. of the select Thank board. Uh, and if I may, may uh, be recognized, Your Honor? Uh, Please continue. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Spending too much time not here. Uh, one thing I wanted just to uh, speak to for a moment, because it's just come up in this discussion, is about uh, bicycle pedestrian work. Uh, the select board allocated $290,000 out of the ARPA funds towards specifically implementing actions out of the bike ped uh, master plan. Um, that was a real priority that we got from the community and uh, we took that uh, to heart and so we allocated a large chunk of ARPA towards that. Um, and so I just think, I'd hope that uh, RTM considers that when they're thinking about um, these funds and that it also is going towards roads and uh, sidewalks, that, that's, um, that there is another um, amount of money that is going to be going towards that work as well. The continuing question is on the Carville Amendment to reduce the amount of funding going to street paving and capital road improvement from the unassigned fund balance. Mr. Stroud. Gary Stroud, District 8, I move that we call the question on the Carville Amendment. Did he move to call the question? Yep. Is there a second? There's a motion to call the question. Uh, Mr. Morton, it's been moved and seconded to cease debate on the Carville Amendment. 
um, to Article 12. That's a motion that limits discussion. It's non-debatable. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of ceasing debate on the Carville Amendment to Article 12, please rise and say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. <laughs> the ayes do have it. And you've ceased debate on the Carville Amendment to Article 12. Um, so now the question before uh, the body is whether to amend Article 12 by striking out the phrase, oh, no, I'm sorry, by striking out the number 268,862 dollars and replacing it with the sum of $135,000. All those in favor of the Carville Amendment, please rise and say aye. <laughs> Thank you. All those opposed to the Carville Amendment, please rise and say nay. nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it, and you've defeated the Carville Amendment. We're back to the continuing question on Article 12 whether the town will raise from the unassigned general fund balance the sum of $268,862 to be used for street paving and capital road improvement projects. Is there further discussion? Mr. Brown. Mr. Moderator, Steve Brown, District 9, I move to call the question. Is there a second? Mr. Stevens uh, seconds. Mr. Brown has moved and Mr. Stevens has seconded to call the question on Article 12. Once again, that's non-debatable because it limits debate. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of ceasing debate on Article 12, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed to, art to ceasing debate on Article 12, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you've ceased debate on Article 12. Right. The question before town meeting at this time is on Article 12, whether the town will transfer from the undersigned general fund balance the sum of $268,862 to be used for street paving and capital road improvement projects. All those in favor of Article 12, please rise and say aye. Thank you. All those opposed to Article 12, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you've adopted Article 12. Article 13, the moderator recognizes Dr. Reichman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Franz Reichman, District 8. I move that the select board be authorized to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum not to exceed $22,235,158 in order to defray to that extent all general fund expenses for the period of July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025, including all highway and Wyndham County taxes and that the select board be authorized to expend in addition any sum authorized for special purpose under any article contained in the warning for this meeting or any special representative town meeting. This motion includes $17,631,970 to be collected in property taxes and the balance to be comprised of all other sources of revenue collected by the town. This motion also provides that the town and school district taxes assessed on the grand list as of April 1st, 2024, shall be due and payable in four equal installments payable to the town treasurer until overdue, then to the collector of taxes, that such payment of the installments shall be received by the town treasurer's office on or before 5 p.m. on August 15th, 2024. November 15th, 2024, February 17th, 2025, and May 15th, 2025, and that interest at a rate of 1% per month be charged from the due date of payment on any overdue payment of the town tax installment or portion thereof, and that a penalty of 8% 
be charged on any overdue payment that remains due and owing on May 16, 2025. Is there a second? Mr. Cook seconds. It's been moved and seconded that the select board be authorized to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum not to exceed $22,235,158 in order to defray to that extent all general fund expenses for the period of July 1, 2024 through June 30, 2025, including all highway and Wyndham County taxes, and that the select board be authorized to expend, in addition, any sum authorized for special purpose under any article contained in the warning for this meeting or any special representative town meeting. This motion includes $17,631,970 to be collected in property taxes and the balance to be comprised of all other sources of revenue collected by the town. This motion also provides that the town and school district taxes assessed on the grand list as of April 1, 2024 shall be due and payable in four equal installments payable to the town treasurer until overdue then to the collector of taxes that such payment of the installments shall be received by the town treasurer's office on or before 5 p.m. on August 15, 2024, November 15, 2024, February 17, 2025, and May 15, 2025, and that interest at a rate of 1% per month be charged from the due date of payment on any overdue payment of the town tax installment or portion thereof, and that a penalty of 8% be charged on any overdue payment that remains due and owing on May 16, 2025. With that motion on the table, or on the floor, I'm sorry, on the floor, and are having been in session now for two hours and 20 minutes, we'll be in recess for five minutes until 11 o'clock. Mr. Grace, what can I do for you?
Thanks. He goes, one of our newest voters, and he's asking why this number here is different than this number here. Scrooges? Oh. Uh, well, so this is about raising... Oh, maybe that's the Thank you. Yeah. Oh, it says it right here, Sonia okay. Silver. Yeah, the top one is expanded. So maybe the Django was looking for an explanation of the difference. Django was looking for a different explanation of the difference between the two 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 right, and the number yeah, that's this in the budget here. They may be answering, but you may be able to answer it very quickly. This is the number here, but it's like twenty two million nine hundred in revenue total. Go, go, you know, right off then. I don't know. Also, Kim Cross, our finance director, might have a... Thank you. 
Good. And they're they're available to do that? But one will be enough to Alright. Let's when will you know? I'm gonna go, go ahead and we'll go till noon and then The motion. The, mo the motion that's on the floor is Article 13 on the annual budget of $22,235,158. The meeting will come to order. The motion on the floor is Article 13 relating to the $22,235,158 budget. Are there any comments or questions? Ms. O'Connor. Hi, Kate O'Connor, District 9. Um, I have never voted against a budget before, but I'm gonna vote against this budget today. And it's gonna come as no surprise to the select board what I'm about to say because I have gone to two select board meetings and brought this up. In the budget we're voting on, the select board has proposed $104,693 worth of salary increases for the department heads. I have absolutely nothing to say bad about the department heads. All around our town staff is wonderful. So my objection is not personal to them. I believe that these um, salary increases are out of touch. You can, have, everybody, they're in just document if you wanna see them, but I'll give you just a little bit of facts. We're talking salaries that range from $91,000 to 139,000. We're talking salary increases that range from $6,200 to $15,984. Percentage-wise, this is between 7.6% and 16.7% salary increases. Um, the reason that the select board um, explained at their meetings why these increases are happening is because they're worried that our department heads are gonna go to other towns. So what they did is they called three towns in the state of Vermont and asked what their salaries were. And that's how they came up with the salary increases that I read and that are in your document. I think we need to look at the people that live in our community. And I'll give you some statistics about the increases that the rest of us are seeing. If you're on Social Security, you're seeing a 3.2% increase. That equates to $108 for the entire year. So if you're on Social Security, you're gonna receive $22,884. If you're on minimum wage, you're gonna see a 3.5% increase, which equates to $1,000. So somebody on minimum wage who works 40 hours a week is going, to, is going to make $28,434. The median household income is $43,776.
in Brattleboro. Wyndham County, it's $65,000. So you can see where we are with that. We're in excess of two minutes. Just oh, okay. We have 27% um, of our population is in poverty. To me, this is a moral issue. It's about who we value, who needs to be lifted up, and who we represent. And to me, that's the 12,000 people that live in our community, young, old, people who've been here forever, people who just moved here, people who volunteer, people who rent, own, unhoused, et cetera. So I'm gonna, first time ever, I'm gonna vote um, against a budget um, because I think this is wrong. Thank you. Dave, are there any further comments? Mr. Goodenow. Um, so uh, I really appreciate Kate's comment. Um, it gives me an opportunity and the rest of town staff here to talk about and defend this decision. Um, so there, I, there are just some numbers I want to throw out to RTM about this. First off, uh, what we're talking about is a total of less than one half of 1% of the total budget. The breakdown of the uh, department head uh, salary increases are really three separate things. One is just the 4% COLA increase that all town employees are going to get if they're outside of a union. And if they're inside of a union, there's a separate negotiated COLA increase. COLA is cost of living adjustment. That's because, you know, we're trying to make sure that their salary means what it means today as what it meant a year ago, two years ago, three years ago with uh, increases in cost of living. Uh, so that alone, just the 4% increase, is $38,666 uh, of the 104 that Kate referenced. So putting that aside, because we are, the board uh, approved that for all town employees, there was a menu option in the budget discussion to increase the 4% to 5% or more than that. The board voted against that. We said 4% was fair. Uh, so that's the 38,000. Then there were basically uh, three other uh, elements to the budget increase on this particular item. One were just regular 4% increase steps for uh, department heads who are, have a structure in their salary for that based on their time served. That is $17,584. The next uh, category are compression issues. So the issue here is where you've got people who are lower than a department head getting paid a higher amount because they're part of a union and they are, their salary is getting closer and closer to a department head who has a lot more responsibilities. That number is $24,559. So that's where we're trying to make sure that the person who is at the top of the department is getting paid a fair amount based on what everyone below them is being paid. It's creating equity within each department and then also looking at equity between the departments for what one department head's responsibilities are compared to another. And then finally, we've given new responsibilities and uh, staffing for these, some of these department heads to look after. And that total uh, increase to account for that uh, responsibility increase is $23,883. So if you combine those last three categories, the normal 4% step increase, the compression step increase, and the new duties and divisions for the department heads, you're really looking at $66,026. And that's, that's really the, the uh, increasing we're doing that's beyond just a 4% COLA increase. And I just want to say, why don't we look at this number, like, at, why aren't we having this number every year, like, uh, an increase for the department heads? Like, why are we suddenly seeing this big increase that Kate's made a point to point out? It's because this really should have been done sooner. We've been, we've been deferring this issue, and we are now catching up and making sure that we have competitive salaries for our department heads so that they don't leave. And we, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure which town specifically we spoke to, but we've looked at a number of other towns for what the department heads that equivalent would be paid. And I can tell you that, for example, Milton, a uh, population of 10,912 people, they pay their police chief 17% more than even what we're proposing. Uh, in uh, uh, Springfield, Vermont, the fire chief is paid 34% more than the increases that we're proposing for our fire chief. 
There also are Vermont Leagues of Cities and Town comparables that we're able to get and we're looking at and we're trying to make them as close as possible. So, in fact, there's probably still work to be done in this to create equity within the departments, within the town staffing, and also to make sure that we're providing uh, a competitive rate so that we're able to retain all of the, all of the service and all of the uh, institutional knowledge that the department heads have. And you see it when you have a question and you want to get into detail at all, it's a department head that's going to come up here and explain it to you. And so we got to make sure that we're paying these people fairly and we're doing it so that we retain them and we're, we're showing them that the town's willing to pay for the work that they're doing and all of the time that they give to us. That's well, all. Thank you. Are there further comments or questions on Article 13? Mr. Agave. When I became involved in uh, municipal affairs 25 or 30 years ago, I did take note, because I am interested in how wealth is uh, d distributed, in the salaries of the management of the town. My recollection is, uh, in the late 90s, the town manager was earning 61000 a year. Uh, 25 or six years or something have passed. And so, um, many, of you, many of you may be surprised to hear me saying this, but I don't consider 135 or 40,000 excessive uh, over the long range. Um, my concern is more that we do all that we can, but this will be up to the unions, which I support very much to make sure that the working stiff in town gets their share, can, can also make a living. And so uh, I support the budget, at, at least as far as, as the salaries go. Ms. Asagawa. Maya Hasegawa, District 8. I think Ian mentioned this a little bit, that we're behind in looking at department head salaries. And my question is, do you know when the last time was we did a look at department head salaries? Or does uh, if I may. Please, Mr. Goodenough. Mr. Moderator. Uh, it's my understanding that we've never done a comprehensive look at all of the department head salaries and made a determination like this before. That's talking to the town manager now. Um, I think individually there may be an answer for like individual department heads that I can work on to get an answer for you. But this type of like looking at all of them that, together. That's what I meant. Yeah. Um, as far as I'm aware, we haven't done this before. And that's kind of what I mean by it's. It's really work that should have been done. And the thing is, if it had been done sooner, and I, I'll put this on myself too, I've been on the board for four years, uh, we probably wouldn't be looking at the increases that we're looking at, but it's all this deferred work that we should have been done, doing to make sure that we're paying them fairly. Thank you. Is that Mr. King? Nate King, District 7. What are the consequences of voting down a budget? Town attorney is interrogated. If the uh, article is voted down, then the select board would need to uh, come up with a revised budget and warn a new special representative town meeting to address a new budget amount. Uh, typically, we don't uh, get to that because usually if there are, uh, if, if folks think that the budget is too high, there might be a motion to reduce it. And in other cases, in recent years, we've had uh, motions to amend to increase the budget. So it can go both ways, but what you're voting on here today is a number 
that will be the budget. But I hope that addresses your question. Ms. Morgan. Hi, I have um, Robin Morgan, District 8. I just have a follow-up question to that, actually. I was just wondering um, if you could speak to what would be the impact of that delay in passing a budget. So like if you're saying, if this article was voted down, the select board has to create, warn, and then somehow we return to vote on a new version of the budget. So that's gonna push it out probably by like a couple months or several weeks at least. And what would that impact? Because I know like with the school district, if we defeated our budget, then the delay in being able to propose and vote on a new budget would limit our ability to renew teacher contracts. We would lose staff members. It would um, impair our ability to receive grant funding. Then we would lose that money. So I was wondering if you could just say what, if any, are the impacts of a budget um, de being defeated and having to be redeveloped? Town attorney is interrogated again. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. With, unlike the school, which has specific statutory requirements as to how you would proceed in the absence of a, a past budget, with regard to the municipal side of things, the select board would need to warn, and that requires a warning of at least 30 days out. So uh, you're really looking in terms of uh, general timing of probably six to eight weeks uh, from now having a special representative town meeting, and that would assume that the select board would jump right on having a, a meeting to come up with a revised budget in the next couple of weeks. The idea would be to have such, uh, if that were to happen, uh, a uh, special uh, representative town meeting prior to June 30th so that as we enter into the next uh, fiscal year, everything uh, flows accordingly forward. Mr. Roser. Robert Ozer, District 9. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to amend the article to reduce the budget by $2 million. It's been moved to um, amend the budget article from $22,235,158 to $20,235,158. Is there a second? second. Mr. Levenback seconds. Um, there's been a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Oser. May I speak briefly, Mr. Moderator? Yes, please. Uh, so I'm sort of a visual guy more than a numbers guy. So I took the numbers from the detail of the budget, the detail sheet, and put them into a graph. And what I can see is that in fiscal year 2023, we're at a certain point. Now, we've, the budget's been going up since 2021, 23. But 23 to 24, the increase is steeper. And then it continues on that steep increase to the present day. So it's curious why that's happening. We could all look at line items in the budget, and I may have a particular argument for a certain line item, and someone else may have a, an argument. But we, as a body, can't address those line items. We can only address the bottom line in the budget. It's also ironic that in this year, we've got additional funding, which is not part of the budget. ARPA funding, revolving loan fund uh, uh, monies. And you would think that with the availability of those other funds that the budget would not increase. Yet it is increasing. And that's disturbing. The other thing that's disturbing is that uh, there was a meeting Tuesday night of the school district, and there might be an increase there. So the increase that you'll actually see is a combination of both the municipal budget and the education budget. And if that goes up 10% and we go up 4%, 
then we're starting to talk about real numbers. So I would say, let's be conservative at this point. Let's be fiscally responsible. Let's reduce the budget that we have, get back to where, about where we were in 2023, and let the select board decide how that gets allocated. And we can certainly have input in that select board process. Thank you. The question is on the OSER amendment to uh, amend the budget number down $2 million. Dr. Tortolani. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bob Tortolani, District 8. Um, I know inflation's been playing a role in things that have been going on in the last uh, two, three, four years. Can someone from the administration tell us about the COLA numbers over the last three or four years? Uh, I know a lot of the budget has to do with salaries and payment of the people who work for the town. So uh, I'd like to have that information in terms of the cost of living increases the last few years and how it affects the budget. Thank you. Member of the administration is interrogated. John Potter, town manager. I, uh, I looked at the actual numbers that RTM approved going back nine years, and the nine-year average has been 4.5%. It's been increasing by 4.5%. This year's budget is increasing by 4.3%, so it's slightly below the long-term average. Um, there, had, there were a few years where it was like 1.5%, 1.8%. So, but if you look over nine years, it kind of all flattens out. And part of that is like some years we're able to address some things, and other years we, we defer it and we, we keep the tax rate down. This is kind of just a um, you know, slightly below average increase if you look at the actual amounts that RTM, that we walk out of RTM with. Are there any further comments on the OSER amendment? Are you ready for that question? Yeah. Yep. All right, the question before the body is whether to amend the total number in Article 13 from $22,235,158 to $20,235,158 uh, being a reduction in $2 million. All those in favor of the OSER amendment to cut the budget by $2 million, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. All those opposed to the OSER amendment, please rise and say nay. Thank you. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it, and you've defeated the OSER amendment. The uh, uh, matter on the floor is the continuing discussion on Article 13, $22 million budget. Ms. Melton. Thank you. Paula Melton, District 7. I have a question for um, the administration regarding um, how the police budget relates to the reserve fund. Um, so in the past, um, we've had many unfilled positions in the police department. And um, the budget this year has not changed for the police department particularly much, but um, we have filled those positions. So those vacancies in the past have created very significant surpluses in the budget, which have helped us meet our guideline for reserve funds um, of 10%, um, which is that fund we were talking about earlier. Um, the unassigned fund balance is basically that surplus. It needs to stay at 10% for our guideline. Um, it's like a, an emergency rainy day fund, and we can scrape off everything but that 10% any year we want. Um, so in the past, so um, for FY24 this year, um, the unused funds from the police budget um, amounted to $558,000 or so, um, which was 2.6% of the overall budget. And I'm just wondering, now that we have filled these vacant positions, um, what is the contingency plan now to ensure we um, make that 10% of the, um, to meet the guideline for the reserve fund. Thank you. 
Member of the administration is interrogated. John Potter, town manager. So the, it's, it is true that uh, we have not had a number of uh, police officer positions filled over the past several years, and that has led to some of the uh, additional funds that were left at the end of the year. Um, it's certainly something that we want to be managing moving forward as those positions has been get, have been getting filled. The police department has been doing an excellent job at recruitment along with the human services department. And we are, uh, we are getting to the point where we will be fully staffed. At that point, there will not be any um, leeway much in the budget, and that it, and, but we did not want to propose to raise property taxes more than, we ha than was necessary. So that is not, um, you know, you know that, that, that we'll just have to manage tightly to that budget and not, uh, not have any sort of cushion to fall back on moving forward. Mr. Evans, France. Isaac Evans, France, District 7. Uh, following up on that question, I'd like to interrogate the um, Finance Committee. Shall on I go ahead? Something specific? And, uh, yes. Um, well, I applaud the, the Representative Town Meeting Finance Committee for their diligence and their advocacy for democratic participation and financial prudence. I'd like to ask them specifically about their um, claim about the impact on the town's long-term financial sustainability of the funding of the Broadwell Police Department. And specifically, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what the reason is for focusing on the Broadwell Police Department regarding the increase in personnel expenses. Member of the Finance Committee is interrogated if they wish to be. Mr. Hel Mr. Levenbach, I know he's chair. If anybody else wants to speak to it, they can too. I'll, I, I'll repeat the, the question on behalf of Mr. Franz. The inquiry is why the focus in the finance report on the police department and uh, what's the finance committee's position about the um, impact on the budget of the police department not having staffing shortages. David Levenbach, uh, District 9, Chair of the Finance Committee. I hesitate to speak on behalf of the entire committee. Uh, the question about the uh, budget for the police department was not really the focus of our argument. Uh, it was, as Ms. Melton pointed out a moment ago, related to the fact that uh, unfilled positions contributed to the fund balance. But more, I think, what motivated what we wrote in the Finance Committee was that we had asked last year for the select board, given the persistence of unfilled positions, to address the question of what was the appropriate size of the police department, how many officers were appropriately needed. That work was never done, and our point in the Finance Committee, and again, any member of the committee may argue with me uh, in front of all of you, but uh, our point was that this was an issue that the Select Board really had a responsibility to address what is the appropriate level of staffing, and they never did. If any other members of the Finance Committee uh, want to speak to the issue. All right, the question on the floor is the $22 million budget um, in Article 13. Is there any further question? Ms. Gossage. Marta Gossage, District 9. 
Um, I wanted to commend uh, Kate O'Connor's remarks regarding the poverty levels in our town, and I do wish that they were brought up more frequently in venues like this and at the select board meetings so that we remain aware of that. However, I would also like to point out how some of our department heads actually serve those communities, uh, specifically three. One is uh, the planning department. A couple years ago, I went to a, a conference in Maine called Grow Smart Maine about um, sustaining, creating and sustaining healthy rural communities. And when I said I was from Brattleboro, Vermont, it was like I was um, a celebrity at our table and everyone was talking about all the things they had heard about everything from the Brooks House um, uh, project to um, all of the amazing planning work that Brattleboro has done. They just knew of us. And um, I want to specifically point out that Sue Fillion was called out on Monday night. We had a um, call with Becca Balent through the Commons talking about housing. And after she dropped off, there was a, I don't remember who he was, a state um, official who came on and talked about housing. And they called out Brattleboro as really one of the only proactive towns doing proactive work to um, remove zoning inhibitions and um, create projects and really said, that Brattleboro is uh, head and shoulders above uh, in the planning department regarding housing. Um, and so to lose um, department heads who serve these projects um, would harm potentially those in need. And as well as Star Electronica, who basically does three jobs. Um, the, her programming at the library is just stellar. We are so lucky to have her. And she also attends like every community neighborhood meeting and I don't even know when she sleeps. She's just present everywhere, as well as taking over um, the library, um, doing the resource sheet for the homeless to where they can get meals and, and stuff like that. That comes now from the library. And uh, the third department had I want to call out, who's just utterly stellar and professional, and I don't think we could replace, is Len Howard of the fire department, who now has an additional department under him, and in the process of the last three or four years, has been highly available to residents to talk about the fire department, um, their concerns. I know he spent probably, I don't know, almost an hour after a meeting uh, talking to me about his goals for the fire department, one of them being that um, he didn't want his employees to just go and punch in at a clock hourly. He wanted them to be salaried and growing as um, professionals and training. Uh, so when we talk about um, salary, increasing salary to retain these employees, I do think specifically those department heads actually serve the population um, in need uh, greater than um, just kind of an average run-of-the-mill department head in those areas could. Are there any further comments, questions about the budget? Mr. Grace. Um, Django Grace, District 9. I would like to propose a $70,000 increase to the proposed budget. It's been moved to amend the budget by increasing uh, by $70,000 to $22,305,158. Is there a second? Second. There's a second from Ms. Morgan. Mr. Uh, uh, Grace, uh, you can speak to that motion, please. Um, I, if you it, want. It is my hope that the select board would allot these additional $70,000 to the Global Warming Solutions Fund. Um, and if I could briefly talk about the Global Warming Solutions Fund and why I think this would be a really good expenditure. Um, so in 2020, the select board um, started the Global Warming Solutions Fund. It's a $70,000 um, annually replenishing fund um, that promotes the um, sustainability and resiliency of town operations. Is that correct? Um, and through my four years on the Energy Committee and through my connection with um, Stephen Dotson, who's our sustainability coordinator, I know this to be the greatest step that Brattleboro has taken towards climate action and sustainability in the 18 years that I've been alive and living in this town. Um, but I think we need more. Um, we can commit to as many figures as we want to, we can make as many declarations, we can go to as many meetings as we want to, but at the end of the day, supporting these projects is how we make a dent in our emissions. Supporting these projects is how we support the people in the town who are on the ground working on reducing our emissions and ensuring 
the longevity and sustainability of our community. Um, what's more, to increase the size of this fund is to increase the capacity of our town to match grants that are possible. Um, a good example of a grant that we've matched, and I don't profess to know the exact figures on this, but we're doing a massive renovation on the ice rink at Memorial Park right now. And just, you know, some context, the rink right now is reliant on a refrigerant called R22, which when released in the atmosphere is 1,815 times more potent than carbon dioxide. In other words, it has a capacity that is 1,815 times higher to trap heat in the atmosphere. If there is a leak at this rink, which there was two years ago, um, the equivalent of that is the entire town fleet driving for one year, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, this is ridiculous. So this fund has made it possible for us to renovate this system. Um, and it's proven itself as something that's really beneficial for our community. So I cannot emphasize more that I think we need to increase this fund. Um, and that's pff, mic drop. <laughs> Mr. Morton. Rick Morton, District 7. I believe that if we try to cut funds or add funds, we cannot direct how that will be implemented. So we might make a movement to increase, but we can't mandate that that's how it'll be used as it was re presented. That may be a good use, but we can't tell the board to do that. That's my understanding. That's correct. The uh, amendment that was made was just to increase the budget for $70,000, and the remaining language was, as we shall call it, precatory. Advisory only. Ms. Morgan. The way I see it is that we can tell the board what to do with that money, but they don't have to listen to us. So I, I think that it is possible to let the board know that this increase is being made with the intention of supporting this fund and that it's to their discretion whether or not to follow that, but I would support the increase. The question on the floor is the Grace Amendment to increase the budget by seventy thousand dollars. Just a moderator. Oh, that's not me. <laughs> Somebody want to speak? Yeah, but I'll let you finish your thought. Mr. Quip is recognized. Thanks so much, um, Django. Thank you for bringing this up. I think, oh, geez, at the risk of not being germane, I think there's some assumptions being made here that like all other dollars that are at work in the town are ignorant of climate change or ignorant of um, complete streets policies. I would say that many of the dollars that are at work in your town, your tax dollars, are actually taken into account. Um, the impacts of climate change, public works does so much work on climate resiliency. Anytime they're building new culverts, they're building them wider uh, to accommodate heavier storm flows. The $70,000 additional to that particular fund, it'll be somewhat helpful, but I don't think the body should be thinking that the only dollars that the town applies to you know, take action on climate change are coming from this fund. Our new water treatment facility is way more efficient than our old one. Um, other infrastructure projects that we undertake are always taking into account the impacts of climate change on this community. And I, I think it is a well-intentioned um, amendment, but we've already heard from this body that you know there is a desire to keep this budget down, and so reluctantly I will vote against this amendment. The question is on the uh, Grace Amendment to increase the budget by $70,000. No, no, Mr. Great. Hold on. Other people want to speak first, and you don't get to speak again until after they do. Hi, Sonia Silbert, District 9. Um, we have heard from a few folks who wanted to uh, lower the overall budget. I wouldn't say that was the majority of the folks here. Um, personally, $70,000 $70, is a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of money um, to, uh, com compared to the budget as a whole, and also a pretty small amount compared to the amount that we just spent a long time debating over keeping our streets paved. Um, 
I, I think there's a, uh, an overwhelming sense that the climate crisis is here. I mean, look what just happened in the last few weeks. There's not a ton that a town our, our, our size can do, but there is a lot more that our town our size could do to address this, and it's gonna take everyone to face the crisis that we're in. Our federal government's not doing enough. Our state government is trying hard. I would say still not doing enough. Brattleboro needs to do more. Later is too late. This is a drop in the bucket, and we need to do more as a community to face the crisis that we're in. Thank you. Mr. Levenbeck. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Levenbach, District 3. Uh, I would like to know if uh, we could be told what is the balance in the Global Solutions Fund currently, and also have there been, are there grants uh, for which the town might apply but does not have sufficient match money to make those come through? Or are there projects which have been uh, deferred lacking $70,000? Thank you. Member of the administration is interrogated if they wish to be. Mr. We, Goodenow. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Moderator. We're working on getting the number now, and I think the second part of Mr. Levenbach's question on, it was grants that are available, or? That are out now. I don't know if we'll be able to answer that question, but I will work on that as well. Are there any further comments or questions on the Grace Amendment to increase the budget by $70,000, Mr. O'Brien? Uh, I'm going to vote in, in favor of this. I think you'll find that uh, money spent towards climate adaptation and mitigation um, is always a good use of money. As mentioned, uh, culvert expansion, being proactive on, on taking these efforts, uh, reduces costs later to fix culverts that are blown out. Thank you. Mr. Duncan. Um, my understanding the budget is going to increase the property tax by over 10 percent. Is that I have more to say, but um, if, if that could be one of the things addressed. Also, climate change is now is absolutely an existential threat. Um, 2023 was the warmest year ever recorded. The ocean heat content blew away uh, the previous year, which was the highest. Um, and while the present federal government is doing some things for this, the amount of propaganda and um, work fighting against doing anything towards climate change in the country is, is tremendous. And I think it's very important for every level of government to do as much as possible. So even though I'm a property owner, and this would in some way affect my property tax, I would support this. Um, I think that there was an inquiry to the select board before, and I think there's an inquiry to the select board now about the about. likely increase in the tax rate. Yep, uh, and I will answer both. Uh, so back to the original the question before, as of December of 2023, it's not totally up to date, uh, the remaining amount in the global, form, global warming uh, solutions fund is $74,821. Um, and uh, the question on what would the tax in, uh, rate increase be for the, pro the budget that's being proposed for RTM to consider today, it is not 10%, it's 4.3%. 4.3. Mr. Grace, I'll get back to you in a second. Uh, Mr. Smith. All right, we have a motion to call the question um, from Mr. Smith, seconded by Mr. Stevens. That's on the Grace Amendment. Mr. Stevens. Um, that's non-debatable uh, because it limits discussion. Two-thirds vote is necessary to cease debate. All those in favor of calling the question and ceasing debate on the Grace Amendment to increase the budget by $70,000, please rise and say aye.
All those opposed to ceasing debate, please rise and say nay. Yeah. Nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. Debate continues. The uh, continued question on the floor is on the Grace Amendment to raise the budget by $70,000. Um, Mr. Evans, friends. I voted in support of increasing the uh, the the funds for the, uh, oh, Isaac Evans, France, District 7. I voted in support of the allocation for the roads and streets, and I support this amendment of this uh, increase for the Global Warming Solutions Fund. This summer I had an opportunity to visit Barrie after the flooding with a delegation that I led, and we saw the real impacts of the flooding on people's lives the diseases that people were experiencing, the doors that would not close, the safety concerns that resulted from the flooding. We have limited capacity to the difference that we can make in terms of the actual climate crisis, but it's important that we do what we can. It's also important that we take the steps that we can to mitigate harm that comes to our community, and this is an investment that I fully support, and I appreciate the leadership uh, Mr. Grace for bringing this uh, issue to our attention and encourage that we support the leadership of young people in our community in addressing the climate crisis. Thank you. Ms. Cooley. Millicent Cooley, District 9. Um, property owner and I'm um, aware of the taxes going up and I think I'm so far generally in favor of the grace proposal but I was also interested in Daniel Quip's comment and I would like to um, actually kind of request to the Energy Committee and other departments to to report back to to the town and to RTM about the wide range of things that are being done because I think everybody's concerned a lot of people are so concerned about it and there is a lot that's being done and I don't think we we necessarily know about it um, so it would be I would be interested in hearing you know what's what positive things have been done across the departments thank you the moderator is going to note that uh, the uh, Town meeting can increase or decrease the budget, uh, but can't uh, uh, specify the purpose for which those funds would be spent. So uh, all the discussion about the Global Warming Fund is advisory to the select board only. Mr. Meese. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. For our Meese District 9. Um, I, I support this amendment and the rationale behind it. Um, one concern that I have, um, given what you've just said, Mr. Moderator, and, and uh, what was in the Finance Committee's uh, report, there, there was um, some concern about the fact that the Select Board um, over the past few years has not taken these uh, precarity appeals into consideration with, uh, with particular regularity, and so I would like to inter interrogate the select board to see if they would actually be amenable uh, to, to using these funds um, or appropriating these funds, distributing these funds as, as uh, directed in, in the uh, uh, amendment. Select board is interrogated. Uh, Mr. Dr. Archman. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Franz Reichsman, District 8. Uh, if these funds were included in the budget, I personally, and I am certainly not speaking for anyone else, uh, would be happy to allocate the money to the Global Warming Solutions Fund. At the same time, I would uh, chime in with my colleague, Mr. Quip here, that there are other things that, that we're doing um, routinely in, uh, to address issues related to climate change. For example, with regard to the refrigerant at the skating rink, uh, without any question, we will not be using some type of chlorofluorohydrocarbon as the refrigerant. Um, my guess is that we'll end up using ammonia, which has some downsides. Uh, it can be toxic, toxic in an enclosed environment. There have been fatalities related to skating rinks using ammonia as a refrigerant. 
Uh, but those can be mitigated if there's adequate ventilation or if the, the refrigeration equipment is in an open space. So I don't worry about that too much. The point is that we're, we are indeed, in that specific example, already well aware of what the choices are and would be moving in the direction of doing what's sustainable. So um, again, if, if this money is allocated by town meeting, I personally would have no trouble um, putting it in the Global Warming Solutions Fund. And I all want to also want to say that we are dedicated to this cause already. Thank you. Mr. Quip. Thank you. Um, I want to kind of circle back to a question that was asked just before about like what work the town has undertaken. So, you know, several years ago, this body did allocate more money that eventually led to the creation of the sustainability coordinator position. Stephen Dalton has been in that position ever since that time and has done an excellent job. He comes to the board annually and gives a report. The most recent one was, I don't know, a couple of months ago. It was very lengthy. There were a great deal of accomplishments. Some of that work is in this town report on pages 59 and 60. I'd encourage you to read it. Um, I would just kind of go back to the point that like this $70,000 addition is perhaps, it's wildly insufficient, you know? So the 20, almost $23 million in this budget that goes towards town operations is our, is our work, you know? And many of, the, many of those dollars, particularly the dollars towards, you know, our infrastructure, are taken into account climate action and climate change resiliency. Um, I think if we were looking to have a meaningful impact, um, you know, it should be in magnitudes much higher than $70,000. Um, and I have zero problem with if this body adds 70000 to the budget saying that it's going to go into the Global Warming Solutions Fund, that's not a problem at all. And I actually think that any time this board's been, you know, advised to put money in a particular place, that that's what we've done. Mr. Heller. Oscar Heller, District 9. I just want to, I'm in favor of this amendment. I just want to say that I think the arguments that the town does, does many things in different areas, that they're aware of this, nobody on the, on the board denies the problem or anything like that. I think those are all valid and they're useful context. I'm not sure how that gets someone to a, who I think otherwise supports this action. I don't know quite how that gets you to a no vote on this amendment. Um, speaking as someone, I don't know. Someone who in years past on the Energy Committee was once scolded by a member of the select board for not being activist enough. Um, I, I'm just not exactly sure how that argument gets to a no vote. So uh, I'm in support of it. I think nothing, no small amount is going to solve the problem. We, but it's, it's a question of continued investment and whether we want to do more or less and take a larger or a smaller step forward, and I think it can only help to do this. Thank you. Ms. Manukin. Abby Manukin, District 8. Um, appreciating Django bringing this to the floor, I will be voting yes on this amendment. And yeah, it feels like there are many different um, rationales being thrown around here, but the fact that it might be not it might not be enough does not mean that it's not symbolically important. Um, and I guess my question for the board is that it seems like seventy thousand is currently being set aside each year for this fund, and yet the current balance is seventy three thousand. So is that does that mean that in the six months of this fiscal year so far, nothing has been spent? Member of Select Board is interrogated. Yes. 
So I guess another concern that I have is that this money is sat on. I think that I read it can carry over for one year, but then it kind of disappears. And no, that's not true. It just like can build and build and build and build. If I may. I, I, the question here is on the budget and increasing the budget. Oh. And uh, the question of how the Global Warming Solutions Fund is being expended is significantly beyond the scope of that inquiry. One more question and answer about that topic, please. So go ahead and answer. Oh, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't go away, it stays. And uh, a good example, and I will, I'm, I will keep it really brief because we're, we're off topic, but um, the, the work that uh, Django was referring to with the uh, uh, improvements at Living Memorial Park, that was um, using funds from the Global Warm Solutions Fund that had built up. Uh, so, you know, it, it's kind of, it is one of the things that you see in these kind of funds, they, they, they kind of ebb and flow in their um, usage, and sometimes when they build up more, that now creates a new opportunity to use it for something else. So I wouldn't necessarily say the fact that we haven't expended out of it in six months is that it's not being utilized or something like that. It's, um, you know, I, it's just sort of the nature of these funds. Okay, well, I will be voting yes, and I also encourage the select board then to take it seriously that this, if this body does vote to approve um, for those 70000 to be directed to that and for that money to be sent, spent. And I will um, speak to that later in terms of community safety fund, which was sat on for many years. And maybe that means that people from this body need to go to the select board with proposals about how the money is spent. Ms. Turbo. Sarah Turbo, District 9. Um, with regards to Mr. Quip's comment that the select board has usually taken the guidance um, of the RTM about how to spend additional money that's allocated at RTM for the budget, I'm wondering if you can actually speak to a track record of that. If you, th if you have a sense of how many times, say in the last five times, that there's been an increase in a budget or an increase in a budget um, amount of money that's not specified at RTM, that the select board has taken the guidance of RTM at the, at the select board's decision making, yeah. yeah. Mr. Quip? Um, I cannot give you a specific number of times. I would say that whilst I've been on this board, if the body has voted in favor of adding or decreasing um, dollars to what's proposed here um, and advise them to be used in a particular direction, I believe that we have, in the occasions that I can remember, taken that advice. Um, it was suggested by another member that we hadn't done that, and I would actually put it to you to name that occasion. Thank you. Zeke. Thank you, Zeke King, District 9. Um, yes, I did uh, support the Ozer Amendment, which I feel a little foolish about because I'm not sure that there it really is a discretionary two million dollars that can be spared um, but I I guess I want to voice my concern um, I come from like a more marginalized background than a lot of people here um, and the way that um, sometimes we speak of human services, um, and I will connect this to the um, matter at hand, but um, when we call it charity or like, you know, this burden on taxpayers, we're not recognizing that the people receiving these services are part of the community. Um, and as I, I'm hearing, Zach, uh, not Zach, Django and Sonia, and Abby, um, their arguments are very convincing. Uh, the argument that we should not allocate an extra $70,000 to the um, Global Warming Fund because it's so inadequate to do actual change is not very convincing because it seems like something would be better than nothing, which I think is the same attitude we take towards human services. Um, and I am excited going forward, I'd like to draw attention to the fact that these issues of poverty and marginalization and um, 
climate catastrophe are intertwined in so many ways. Um, for example, I've talked to unhoused people in the community and after the floods last summer, a lot of their campsites were flooded out. I spoke to one um, unhoused woman who um, was unable to retrieve um, a urn with the ashes of her loved one from her tent site because the police had trespassed them trespassed them after the flood. Um, another issue, um, I'm not, I'm sure that the, the carbon or the, the climate change burden that the, um, the rink, um, that, that impact, the, the issue of like trash and waste might pale in comparison, but it is an issue people are aware of. Um, when people are unhoused um, or struggling, not having basic needs met, um, there's less ability to have, cho um, they're not empowered to make choices and they Seek. make their impact on the local, the environment, um, one that is um, uh, beneficial in, in the beneficial direction rather than um, uh, create a worsening um, climate change. I Zeke, would, Zeke, yeah. You're well in excess of the two minutes. If you could please wrap up your comments. Okay, I'll, Thank I'll you. wrap it up. So I, I'm, I'm excited to vote for this, and I also um, think that these committees um, should have, should bear in mind, there's things, there's a community garden at Great River Terrace that could be expanded. There, another way that poverty and climate change connect is when you are unhoused, when you, there is more of, um, a reliance on fossil fuel systems rather than um, self-sufficiency and sustainability in terms of where your your food comes from, where the things you use come from, your ability to not create more trash. I know homeless people who go around town just picking up trash, just to have something to do because they are dying to have to to be needed and to have a Zeke, to be thank connected you. to the community. So to, to connect these things, uh, some of these funds that we might allocate to the um, climate change fund can also be used to expand programs that connect marginalized people within the community to you know food sustainability and other ways that they can have a positive impact on Thank the you, Zeke. Since the human Zeke, if you could please finish up so your small. comments. Thank you. Mr. Sprite. Frick Sprite, District 3. Uh, I'm a new member of the uh, Energy Committee this year, and uh, it's been my pleasure to work with Django and uh, see his energy and vision and enthusiasm, which uh, uh, I think we're all grateful for. As a taxpayer, um, I am always looking for ways to find efficiencies in government so that uh, all of us are not being burdened as we are. Uh, we have tax rates that are pretty crazy in town. Uh, that being said, uh, $70,000 is truly just a symbolic amount in this situation, but I think it's a very important symbol. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it, gives a message about priorities that I think is incredibly important. Um, so regardless of whatever else we reduce, and I'll be looking for those things, I think this is an opportunity to say to uh, Django and to the world that we take this seriously enough to make a little nudge to the needle today. Thank you. Dr. Tortolani. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Bob Tortolani, uh, uh, District 8. 
I, I just want to express the, some of the difficulties I'm having with this particular uh, uh, vote, my, my vote. And I, I, I imagine some other people are feeling the same way. How can you possibly be against uh, doing anything in favor of climate? At the same time, I feel a great responsibility in trying to do whatever I can to not increase the tax burden of the community. And that's what I'm, my struggle right now in terms of how to vote on this uh, amendment. So um, I don't even know what I'm going to do with the vote, but I, I, I agree with the, uh, the message here. I'm trying to just not increase the burden of our taxpayer. Thank you. Mr. Stevens. Hi. Sam Stevens, District 9. I motion to amend the Grace Amendment such that the amount listed in the article is not changed, but the amount requested is maintained uh, as an informal request to the select board that we spend on climate action. So that um, motion um, is not in order. Um, the time for a non-binding uh, resolution is in other business and so that motion would negate the intent of the uh, amendment that's been proposed and so that's not in order sorry uh, Ms. Cooley I think I'm hearing similar statements again so I'd like to call the question Mr. Grace, there was a call. The, was that call the question? Yes. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Is there a second for calling the question, Mr. Morton? There's a motion and a second to call the question. Uh, motion to call the question is not debatable because it ceases debate. Um, Two thirds vote is necessary. All those in favor of ceasing debate, please rise and say aye. 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 Please be seated. All those opposed to ceasing debate, please rise and say nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've ceased debate on the Grace Amendment. The question before the body is whether to amend Article 13 by, sorry, cancel, to increase the um, budget by $70,000 to $22,305,158. All those in favor of the Grace Amendment to increase the budget by $70,000, please rise and say aye. Aye. All right, please be seated. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The chair is in doubt. Um, we're going to call for a division. Uh, all those in favor of the Django, of the Grace Amendment uh, to increase the budget by $70,000, please remain, rise and remain standing. Oh, well. We said, you can be seated. All those opposed to the amendment, please rise and remain standing.
Listen to the results of your vote. You can be seated. Listen to the results of your vote. Those in favor are 65. Those opposed are 41. The amendment carries. So you've amended your budget to $22,305,158. Uh, it's 10 afternoon. Um, if we can finish up the budget article relatively promptly. Um, Mr. Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mike Hutchison, District 8. Um, I, I have a general question about the bottom line of the budget. Uh, the number that's been quoted uh, in the motion um, seems to differ from the bottom line of the printed budget. Um, the number I'm seeing in a number of places is uh, 22,993,000 and plus before this amendment. So I'm just asking about that roughly $758,000 difference. I think that question arose at the last recess. I believe Mr. Moreland knows the answer, or somebody else may be able to answer it. Mr. Potter. I think I can. Uh, John Potter, town manager. The uh, previous motions that the, uh, that the meeting has approved are deducted from the number that you were quoting, so it's, we, there, there's a less of a need because some of it's already been approved by the meeting. Is there further debate? Ms. Manukin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Abby Manukin, District 8. I want to respectfully say that I think your comment that we should somewhat quickly um, vote on the budget or finish discussion is out of line and diminishes this process of why we are here. So I hope any and all who want to speak to this item will feel welcome to do so. Um, but in relation to the general budget, I have two comments that are um, related, but also <laughs> separate, um, and related to the comment that I made to you, because I'm disappointed that there are actually a few important items that have been taken off the table for us to discuss. One of them in the finance um, committee notes being 2C um, for the community marketing initiative, which is now being taken out of the revolving loan fund. There was actually a Paula Melton amendment last year to say, if we're gonna keep discussing this, but it's not gonna make any impact, maybe we should put it in the general fund, which was voted down. And then the select board kind of got around that to, to try to eliminate debate um, in part maybe, and put it in the revolving loan fund. So we now have no say in terms of how, if and how that is um, spent. And the Finance Committee actually um, expressed great concerns about this because they said it's a grant of $160,000 with no strings attached. Um, they don't support public, use, public funds for projects whose goals are unclear. They think it blurs the boundaries between public and private initiatives. And they think that the salary is excessive when compared with the salaries of actual town employees. We no longer, as a, as a town body, have a place to actually give input about that. But I really appreciate the Finance Committee's work on it. And the second, which is related to um, some of the points that the Select Board made earlier about whether or not they listen to how we should spend the money that we've requested in terms of ARPA funding, which also is not part of this. There's like no way to weigh in anymore. The town asked for our input through several surveys and then basically disregarded the top choices that the public submitted and went, through, went forward with others. And so I'm really disappointed that we are here as elected members of the body to, um, to represent people in the town and our input is being diminished. Please, no clapping, unless we're also gonna have booing. The inquiry about lunch has to do whether whether we're going to finish the budget before lunch or we're going to continue the budget discussion after lunch, not seeking to limit discussion about the budget. I would note that the inquiries about the um, SEVEDS funding and the uh, marketing initiative money and the ARPA money are not really at issue with respect to the budget. So uh, while those issues were raised, at um, the informational meeting on Tuesday. Um, 
I think that the time to raise those issues is at select board meeting where that decision was made. Uh, is there any further discussion about the budget? No. Mr. Carville. George Carville, West Brattleboro. Take you all the way back this has to when we first well. started talking about this Thank article. And Ms. O'Connor expressed that she so was right. going to vote against it and, and wait, why. Wait, Anyone with her experience and time in this community gets listened to, by me anyway, when they make such a profound statement. I'm listening to that. But it also occurred to me that we don't know the impact of the school budget yet. The state still has to go through whatever its process is. If we were to vote the budget down, we could come back later knowing what the school tax would be and then knowing the total impact of our uh, town budget vote. Mr. Heim. Steve Heim, District 9. Um, I just thinking about all of the uh, times I've heard the word uh, affordability uh, from legislators and um, senators and people, well-meaning people who care about Vermont and Vermonters. And I just think budgets really speak directly to um, affordability. And um, it, it comes from meetings like this. And if we're going to uh, in, increase taxes, uh, we, have to, we have to consider um, that those expenses do get passed on and they make things not so affordable. And so, uh, you know, you can see um, in government a lot of times, and the solution is grant money um, to, to allocate it to, to certain demographics. Um, so I just think, like, <laughs> as far as um, Brattleboro and like uh, we have w there's a problem with uh, workforce here and we, we talk we're talking about housing specifically um, attracting developers these are all like difficult these are difficult questions but a, a, a lot of it is the math doesn't pencil out like it's it's just too expensive and, and one of the reasons is is, you know, Vermont has the seventh highest uh, tax rate in, in the country, and that takes into account um, local taxes, like municipal tax. And um, so, so I'm thinking, like, well, what makes us so special to be, have such a high tax rate? I mean, if we're looking, if we're looking to other towns uh, to see what they're paying their department heads and comparing, do we look to other states and see what they're charging their taxpayers? Uh, do we look to other states and see their bigger GDPs, um, their ability to build multifamily housing without public-private uh, partnerships? Um, that we can't, we can't seem to be able to do that. Um, so a lot of this does come down to th these expenses that are passed on to taxpayers and renters. Renters are taxpayers uh, because these, these, these very high costs um, get passed on. So when I uh, sounds like I'm complaining about taxes, well, I mean, I hope that you'll trust it. Really does come from a place of compassion because uh, you know the way things are going, it's just it's too much. And so I just would like to ask, uh, um, how hard are we really trying uh, to keep these taxes down? And um, can we try to see how? the sustainable spending is, is actually um, is caring for each other. Thank you. Question is on the budget article, $22,305,158. There's a corresponding amendment that also be made um, in the item in the line below relating to property taxes, raising that to $17,701,970. Ms. Morgan. Thank you, Robin Morgan, District 8. I just wanted to speak to um, the idea that Mr. Carville expressed about waiting to see a, a concrete number of what the school tax rate would be. Because that is dependent on the yield, a, a number determined by the state, um, it's not going to be known until probably like 
mid-May when the legislature recesses. So that seems like it would be cutting it very close to our fiscal year to wait until that number is available. Questions on the budget article? Is there any further discussion? Mr. Quip. Sorry, it's hard to be seen over here. Um, I just want to kind of speak to the ARPA expenditures and answer concern that the public weren't listened to in there. I'm, I'm assuming that there was a feeling that they weren't listened to in their responses to some surveys, uh, because there were a couple of items that were high on those surveys that the select would did not fund through its ARPA process. What we did do on Tuesday was fund two of those items um, through another pot of money that we knew was going to be available and was more significant than what was going to be available through ARPA. Uh, so one of those was uh, new funding sources to create and rehabilitate affordable and middle-income housing. On Tuesday, we funded that to the tune of $500,000. The ARPA budget had it at 250, And the other one was a town-owned land housing feasibility study, and that was funded at $60,000. And both of these events occurred, well, not on Tuesday, I guess Thursday, uh, two days ago. Um, at a select board meeting. Um, I appreciate all of the questions about the budget. This is our most robust conversation about the budget in several years, and it absolutely should be a big conversation. The budget process happens, you know, the, the sausage gets made in the fall with the select board, and I would encourage folks, as much as they're able to, to stay engaged with that process and, you know, voice concerns about priorities for those dollars there, because it's really hard, as we're all seeing here, to. Um, do that after the budget is, you know, sent to town meeting. So I thank you for your concerns and your questions and your desire to hold us accountable. I want to be accountable to you all as well. That's why I changed my mind and voted in favor of Django's 70,000 before. Um, you know, it is the right thing to do. I'll talk to you privately about why. And I just think that it's really hard to have big impacts on the budget on this day. And so please work with us during the budget cycle. Question is on the budget as amended. Are you ready for that question, Mr. Davis? Andrew Davis, District 9. Um, I agree that it's a little late. I'm not going to change a thing. But I just want to come ask a question of the select board. In this budget, we have budgeted for the coming year over $350,000 for the purchase of gasoline, diesel, and heating fuel. We all know that the two biggest drivers of climate are heating and transportation. Are there active conversations? Although that sounds like a lot of money to the homeowner, 350000 it's 1.5% of the budget. But are there active discussions on electrifying our heating and transportation in this town? Thank you. Member of the select board is interrogated. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we had a presentation from Stephen Dotson, uh, our um, sustainability coordinator, uh, and uh, I think a couple, two months ago, um, and we actually had quite a bit of discussion about that, uh, installing, um, uh, uh, charging stations both for the public but then also specifically um, sort of ramping up our charging uh, capabilities for the town uh, as we move our fleet further towards electric entirely electric vehicles um, there's more discussion to be had around emergency vehicles because there's a lot that goes into that um, but we don't only drive emergency vehicles in the municipality we drive a lot of trucks and cars and things like that, and there has been a lot of discussion. And I think um, that is, that's going to just continue, and it's going to be a slow process as we move forward. And the budget you are considering today considers the fact that that is going to be something we're phasing in, and so we still have a lot of gas-powered vehicles. Question is on the budget, $22 million, raising $17,700,000 in taxes. Is there any further discussion? Are you ready for that question? Question before the body is whether the select board will be authorized to raise, appropriate, and expend some not to exceed $22,305,158 
in order to defray to that extent all general fund expenses for the period July 1, 2024 through June 30, 2025, including all highway and Wyndham County taxes, and that the select board be authorized to expend in addition any sum authorized for special purpose under any article contained in the warning for this meeting or any special representative town meeting. This motion includes $17,701,970 to be collected in property taxes and the balance to be comprised of all of the sources of revenue collected by the town. This motion also provides that the town and school district taxes assessed on the grand list as of April 1, 2024 shall be due and payable in four equal installments payable to the town treasurer until overdue, then to the collector of taxes that such payment of the installments shall be received by the town treasurer's office on or before 5 p.m. on August 15, 2024, November 15, 2024, February 17, 2025, and May 15, 2025, and that the interest at the rate of 1% per month be charged from the due date of payment on any overdue payment of the town tax installment or portion thereof, and that a penalty of 8% be charged on any overdue payment that remains due and owing on May 16, 2025. Are you ready for that question? All those in favor, please rise and say aye. 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 Please be seated. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted Article 13 as amended. Um, it's 1230. There had been a concern about the possibility that we would have interpreters available after 1.30 or 2 o'clock but we've made arrangements, so the meeting will stand in recess for one hour until 1.30. Please make sure to check in when you return. Thank you. Yeah, please. Well done. I realized I couldn't be the first one out of the room, you know, that's what I thought, you know. <laughs> We did. We did. Do you remember David. that commercial? I think it was uh, for Federal Express. This guy who just, just spoke at incredible straight speed. And I'm from Brooklyn, speed. David. What? I'm from Brooklyn. I used to talk way more quickly. Way more quickly. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I got a text from Leo wishing you goodbye because today. <laughs> <laughs> so he texted me. Like, you could have texted me too, you know? Dog, and I was like, oh, Not today. Yeah. Not today.
Thanks for coming back after lunch on this inclement weather day. Can we please confirm from the counters that we have a quorum? All right, we have a quorum, but there's less people here than before lunch. Um, make sure to check back in when you return from outside. Um, on Article 14, moderator recognizes Peter Case. Thank you. Article 14, I move to elect two representatives to serve on the Capital Grants Review Board for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Do we have a second? Mr. Carville seconds. It's been moved and seconded to elect two representatives to serve on the Capital Grants Review Board for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Um, the way we're going to proceed on these articles relating to elections um, is we will take the motion and then we will ask for nominations and once nominations close, um, if there are the same number of candidates as there are slots, um, we'll either vote them as a slot or they'll be elected by unanimous consent. Um, if there are more candidates than there are slots, uh, we'll have to vote for them. Robert's Rules provides for voting in the order of nomination, which means that oftentimes you may not even get to the last people who've been nominated. We're not going to proceed that way. If there are more candidates than there are slots, we'll just uh, divide the House and get to a point where we see who's got the most votes. Are there any nominations for Capital Grants Review Board? Yes, sir. Bob Ferranti. Uh, I'd like to nominate George Herzog. George Herzog is nominated. He's not here. He, oh, he is here. Okay, excellent. Do we have any other nominations for Capital Grants Review Board besides Mr. Herzog? Mr. Stevens. Sam Stevens, District 9. I'll go ahead and nominate myself. Thank you. We now have two nominations for Capital Grants Review Board, George Herzog and Sam Stevens. Are there any further nominations? Seeing none, all those in favor of George Herzog and Sam Stevens serving on Capital Grants Review Board for uh, one year term until 2025 representative town meeting, please stand and say aye. Aye. Thank you. Any, uh, all those opposed, please rise and say nay. That carries by unanimous vote. Thank you for your service. The next article is 15. We recognize, the moderator rep recognizes Daniel Quip. Thank you. I move to elect or appoint representatives to serve on the representative town meeting finance committee for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. And to Is there a... Yes, thank you for helping me out. <laughs> Do you want me to keep going? No, finish, I'm sorry. Thanks. And to further authorize the moderator to make additional interim appointments to the Town Finance Committee for a term to expire at the next annual representative town meeting. Is there a second? second. Mr. Herzog seconds. It's been moved and seconded to elect or appoint representatives to serve on the representative town meeting finance committee for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. 
and to further authorize the moderator to make additional interim appointments to the Town Finance Committee for a term to expire at the next rep annual representative town meeting. Are there nominations? Moderator recognizes Mr. Levenbach. Thank you, David Levenbach, uh, District 9. Uh, I do have some names for you, and there may be others as well. Uh, but first, I want to uh, note that Paula Melton is going to step away from the committee. Uh, in addition to the work that she did, fine work she did, in investigating aspects of the uh, budget, she's also been the compiler and editor of our report for the last several years. And the committee thanks her, and I believe so should you. I will note that the moderator also joined in the applause. <laughs> Dif different kind of applause. Very good. So uh, I nominate for your consideration uh, Oscar Heller, Mike Hutchison, and Millicent Cooley, and they would be re-elected to the committee. I also nominate Ernie Coughlin and Jackie Reese. Are there other nominations for the Finance Committee? Ms. Hasegawa. Maya Hasegawa, District 8. I would like to nominate David Levenbach and Kevin O'Brien. Are there other nominations? Mr. Garza. Ruben Garza, uh, District 9. I would like to nominate Christina Ina Shayanye. Are there other nominations? Ms. Cooley. Please. Uh, I just want to, uh, you know, the Finance Committee does, is acting in representation of everybody here. So I want to have, um, ask anybody who's interested to just give us feedback to any members of the committee on what they'd like to see the Finance Committee do. Um, in terms of our focus on content or the way the report is written, is it clear, et cetera, or could it be more clear in other ways? So I don't think this is the time for the discussion, but I just want to make, just put that out so that we are open for feedback. Okay? Thank you, Ms. Cooley. It is noted that the Finance Committee is seeking feedback from any town meeting representatives, from anybody else who wants to comment on the Finance Committee's work over the course of the year. It's been very helpful for many years, and they'd like your feedback, please. We have two, four, six, eight nominations so far. Are there any further nominations for town, representative town meeting finance committee? Hearing none, it's been moved to elect David Levenbach, Oscar Heller, Michael Hutchison, Millicent Cooley, Ernie Coughlin, Jackie Reed, Kevin O'Brien, and Christina Shayante to be members of the Representative Town Meeting Finance Committee for a term of one year until the 2025 Representative Town Meeting, and to further authorize the moderator to make additional interim appointments to the Town Finance Committee for a term to expire at the next annual Representative Town Meeting. You ready for that question? Mr. Moderator. Dr. Reichman. Uh, Thank you, Franz Reichsman, uh, District 8. Uh, I just want to make a small correction. It's Jackie Reese, not Jackie Reed, who's been nominated. Reese. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of electing those eight representatives, please rise and say aye.
Aye. You can be seated. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. Those eight members are elected to the uh, Town Meeting Finance Committee. Um, for Article 16, moderator recognizes Elizabeth McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move to direct the Select Board to allocate to Human Services funding in the FY26 budget in an amount equivalent to up to 1.4% of the FY25 budget. Is there a second? Mr. Carpenter? Mr. Kennedy. Yeah. Um, it's been moved and seconded um, to direct the select board to allocate to human services funding in the FY26 budget an amount equivalent to up to 1.4% of the FY25 budget. Is there any discussion? Ms. Turbo. I'd like to amend uh, this article, please, um, from 1.4% to 2%. Is there a second? Ms. Mnookin seconds. It's been moved and seconded to amend Article 16 to direct the Select Board to allocate to Human Services funding in the FY26 budget an amount equivalent to up to 2% of the FY25, uh, FY25 budget. Um, is there any discussion on the Turbo Amendment? Ms. Turbo. I've never had an amendment named after me. It's very exciting. Um, <clears throat> Yes, so 2% uh, is what was approved last year. Um, and as many may have noted, uh, the amount that was requested this year did not reach that, um, that ceiling threshold. However, it is our belief in the Human Services Committee that it takes a year for sort of mm -hmm. things to catch up. In the past, when the number has been raised the following year, there's actually been a higher number. In fact, oftentimes exceeding the number that uh, uh, is set as a ceiling. Um, I feel very strongly as a member of the Human Services Committee that we really did look very closely at all the programmatic uh, requests that came in and actually ended up allocating less than was requested. Because the amount that was requested was lower than the ceiling, we could have just looked at it and said, oh, okay, well, this is below the ceiling, we'll just approve everything, that's fine. But we didn't. We went through a very rigorous and very extensive process to make sure that the funds were allocated appropriately. Um, and we believe that there continue to be huge needs, uh, or I believe there continue to be huge needs for human services in our community that are not yet being met and want to have the opportunity to expand those services um, if needed. So uh, I propose that we return to the 2% number which I believe, in terms of actual dollars, would be about as much, if not just slightly more, than the actual dollar amount from this past year. Thank you. Discussion is on the Turbo Amendment. Mr. Sprite. Frick Sprite, District 3 squared. Uh, I would like to echo uh, Andy Davis's uh, comments about the Human Service Committee. and. Uh, say that uh, we are, I think, collectively grateful for their efforts and the quality of their work. Um, I think it's a testament to the quality of the work that they did not um, just give everybody everything they asked for. Um, I think it's to our credit that we gave them the 2%. Um, and I think it's a, a sign that we are uh, they are uh, they, the uh, nonprofits, the human services agencies are uh, working to their capacity that uh, we didn't use that all up. So uh, I will support the 2% again. Um, and uh, yeah, keep up the good work. Are there further comments? Ms. Melton. Paula Melton, District 7. Um, I am recalling many, many years when this, war this um, article was not on the warning, and I um, want to acknowledge um, that 
at the request of um, the community that one year Daniel Quip added this as like, okay, for next year, let's set the budget. Um, so thank you to the select board for continuing that tradition. And um, historically, we have many times said 2% is the ceiling. Um, and so I think, you know, I appreciate the desire to go back to the 1.4, which sort of like turned into a default at one point, um, even though like RTM as a body has year after year um, basically suggested 2%. So I'm definitely gonna vote yes on this amendment. Further comments? Um, Zeke. Would this be the correct time? I would uh, propose to raise the um, ceiling from 2.2% to 2.3%, um, like um, the, for, the previous speaker mentioned there right, hold is. Hold on, hold um, on, hold on. If you want to make a motion to amend, we need to see if there's a second, and then you can speak oh, to it. So all just right. stay, I'd like to wait there, amend. wait there, okay? Is there a second to go to 2.3 percent? No. Is there is there a, a Mr. Carville? Uh, so Zeke King has moved, and Mr. Carville has second to. Um, amend the turbo amendment from 2% of the FY25 budget to 2.3% of the FY25 budget. Uh, Zeke, uh, you can speak to that uh, motion to amend. Yeah, when it comes to human services, um, there are a lot of organizations doing really good work, but there is a lot of services that are needed that aren't present. Like, for example, there's no, now for, for at least a couple of years, the retreat no longer does any sort of um, drug uh, treatment, detox, or re rehabilitation for um, people who are suffering with, with um, substance use disorder. Um, you know, substance dependency, which we all know is a huge problem in our community. So I think if we raise the ceiling, if there were um, programs that came into existence that would address like this need, which in my conversations with the unhoused population, that's their priority would be to have a rehab facility in Brattleboro that they don't, or in, at least that they don't have to drive two hours to get to or wait two two weeks minimum to get into. Um, so I would I would I think it would be really really behoove our town to treat um, this crisis um, to have more leeway in funding um, uh, a program like that if it becomes extant and. Um, other other programs as they come up. I mentioned again before food like um, yeah. So that don't don't want to go over my two minutes. But. Well, thank you. <laughs> Are there any comments on the? King Amendment to the Turbo Amendment. Ms. Atkinson. So could the folks over in um, finance land, oh, Margaret Atkinson District 8. Um, finance land, just tell us what the difference what, what the 2% amount would be since we voted on the budget and what a 2.3 amount would be and what the the difference between that and the proposed 1.4 thank you the administration is interrogated about the difference between 1.4 percent 2 percent and 2.3 percent of the fy25 budget yes thank you mr moderator so the uh 1.4 percent would be three hundred and twenty two thousand eight hundred and ninety three dollars 
the one, uh, the two percent would be four hundred and sixty-one thousand two hundred and seventy-six dollars, uh, and the last was for the one two point three percent. Yes, that was five hundred and thirty thousand four hundred and sixty-eight dollars and nine cents. Um, and I think was there a question on the percentage increase, or no? There was not. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Davis. Andrew Davis, District 9. Um, HCRS, as an, as an example that was raised, has a $45 million budget. I'm on a board of a similar but smaller agency, and Staffing is often a uh, reason why services are not readily available. But I'm not sure we can do anything here today to affect the operation of a human services agency like HCRS that operates, that was their 2021 budget, was $45 million. So as much as I favor, um, human service work, I will be voting against this amendment. Thank you. Further uh, comments or questions? Are you ready for that question? Mr. Moderator? Mr. Quip. Thank you. This might not be germane, but I'm going to ask it and you can tell me. Could the Human Services Review Committee maybe speak to what they, how they prioritize these dollars? Because I do think that if we can send our dollars to the most impactful place for the betterment of our town, that would be great. You know, so raising it from 1.4 to 2 to 2.3, if it's still just 20 grand here, 20 grand there, I would want those dollars to do their best work. Um, you know, the kind of things that Zeke is talking about is probably not really possible from this small amount of money. The member of the Human Services Funding Committee is. Uh interrogated if they wish to be about the process by which they allocate funds to the various organizations that make applications. Thank you, Mr. Miner. I'm David Miner, District uh, 7, uh, and the chair of the Human Services Committee. I direct you to page 19, uh, where we outlined uh, the allocation process that we go through um, and, and what, our, what our focus is. Uh, we certainly give and provide uh, funding to a variety of different organizations that provide um, assistance and human services to uh, a number of different types of organizations. So um, we're dealing with organizations that provide uh, assistance to youth, assistance to elderly, assistance to uh, those who are drug dependent, assistance uh, to uh, all uh, sexual orientation. So we, we really go across the board um, and we weigh each uh, individually using the rubric score. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of discussion and conversation as to uh, each application that we receive um, and what, what, what their need is and, and how we might support. Um, I will take a look at what we look, uh, go back maybe a couple years where uh, the second year where we had 1.4%, um, Sarah kind of uh, you know, alluded to what we went through there. Um, the year before, the first time in 1.44%, we were roughly 20, the apps we received uh, were roughly uh, $20,000, $30,000 less than, than what the amount was. The second year they went, we went through there, the a number of uh, grant requests was exceeded the amount that was uh, uh, provided for by RTM by almost $100,000. We had to go through each and every one. Uh, that was an uh, an arduous task to be able to come up with a way to be fair and to be able to uh, uh, provide uh, the amount of allocations uh, where, where it's necessary. 
I think that the 2% that we have uh, going up to 2% is, is, is important. Um, and as Sarah indicated, I think that we take that responsibility seriously. Uh, we take a look at the individual applications and, and uh, we, we you know, provide the grants accordingly. Uh, but again, it's, it's across the board and, and we're not, I think, focusing on any one uh, you know, need within, within the community, but, but multiple. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miner. Any further comments or questions about the King Amendment to the Turbo Amendment? Are you ready for that question? Sorry. Mr. Quibb. Um, my experience of being on the select board the last several years is that people come to our meetings, you know, a couple of times a month, and look to us for answers to like really big social problems. You know, um, a lack of housing in our community, a lack of um, services to support people who use drugs. And when I look at the small amounts of money that's going to many different organizations, I just feel like we're not really moving the needle on that despite spending around $300,000 out of our general fund budget. And so, I'm feeling some kind of like disappointment that we put so much money in this direction and I question how impactful we can really be. Um, I would love to be impactful on all of those issues um, and I don't feel like I have much, many tools to do that job. Ms. Turbo. <clears throat> Sarah Turbo, District 9. Um, I, have, I have two thoughts about that. One is, one of the uh, ways in which we evaluated the applications was also to see to what degree these organizations collaborate with one another. So we don't believe that we're funding just isolated organizations that are doing work in you know, a, a, um, a silo. A lot of these organizations are working together to provide a human services infrastructure and ecosystem in our town and work very closely together. Um, and so I think that there is, it, it's more of a holistic approach. Um, and I would say that in our town, as opposed to in maybe some other towns or certainly other places, um, some of the human services that I, I personally believe should be provided by the operating funds of the town, the core budget of the town. For example, homeless services is almost entirely outsourced to a nonprofit organization in our town. And so by all means, if the select board feels that there should be more money spent on these efforts and in support of these populations, would love the select board to be allocating more general funds to that amount. Um, this is the amount that the Human Services Committee has to allocate, and we are asked, again, these funds are often small amounts, but they have large impacts in our communities, and they are oftentimes key to these organizations being able to function. Again, I personally believe that they should be far more subsidized by our town. I don't think that's the responsibility of the Human Services Committee and the Human Services Committee budget, per se. In the, yeah. Trish Twining, District 9. Um, to what extent, uh, this is a, a, an inquiry, um, to what extent do we review the use of the funds that we distribute to these organizations and uh, have any kind of quality metrics as to what kind of result they have achieved? I think the member of the Human Services Funding Committee is queried. Thank you, Mr. Miner. So part of the application process is to uh, inquire of um, the, the amount of money that was provided the year previous if, if an organization is, is reapplying, um, and to understand and ask how, in fact, um, the funds were used. Were they used in the way that they described and made the request? Further, further, than, further than the application goes on and is looking for uh, an understanding as to the number of Barrow residents that, uh, that they are impacting, how they're going about it, uh, the, um, the availability of, the pro of, of their program uh, to, to the uh, residents in the, in, uh, that they've identified. 
And so that's, uh, that is an important uh, consideration of, of what we look at. Thank you, Mr. Miner. Further inquiry, uh, Mr. Heller. Oscar Heller, District 9. Um, I think I've had the same thought as Daniel before, which is that the human services process right now is pretty reactive, although I think it's a great process and it's a ton of work, and I'm certainly not volunteering to do it, and I'm very thankful to those who do it. But organizations make requests, and then the committee decides to fund them partially or not fund them at all, which is different from a strategic approach where, say, the select board identifies some problems, splits this money up into, you know, allocates it into different areas and then sort of makes strategic decisions about, okay, we have $200,000 we want to spend towards the housing aspect of human services. What is the best way to do that? So I think that's a process that would be very interesting and valuable. It probably would need to be done from at the select board level or the town staff level or maybe the RTM level certainly not a job to put on the committee's shoulders, but I agree that that's an interesting way to think about it, um, an alternative. So, thank you. Ms. Melton. Paula Melton, District 7. Um, I definitely, like, see where um, people are coming from about the amount of impact we can make through this, um, these allocations. I do want to mention something that I don't, I don't think I've heard anyone say yet today. Um, for those who aren't familiar with this, in the sort of philanthropic granting world, um, most of the money that you apply for is like for a one-time thing. And um, one way that the town funding makes a difference for these organizations is they can use it for ongoing operations, salaries, all of that stuff. So they can actually use it um, in a different way than people, um, than organizations use other, like a lot of grant funding. Ms. Manukin. Abby Manukin, District 8. Um, I will be voting yes in favor of this amendment. Um, I hear the point about organizations like HCRS that have such tremendous budgets. What could something like 10 or even $25,000 do? But perhaps more importantly, a question to ask is like an organization like the Root Social Justice Center, which is working for racial justice in our community, a $25,000 grant like they just received this year can actually fund half of a full-time position for that organization, which is really doing like tremendously important work and makes a big difference. Um, I also hear comments about systemic problems like housing, substance use disorder, um, all sorts of issues related to food insecurity, housing insecurity, poverty. Um, clearly, this is not gonna address those problems, but we need to put our money where our mouths are. And if these are priorities, we, this is like one way of addressing them. I also wanna apologize to the select board about using $2 million for, um, to put towards affordable housing that I wasn't aware of that is gonna be separate from ARPA funding. So there are other initiatives in place, but looking at an organization like Groundworks and saying, you've been doing work for a really long time, why is homelessness still an issue? Because of racialized extractive capitalism. That is a really tremendous problem that we're gonna to have to address in all of the ways. They still need our funding. We still need to support the needs of the people in our community. Continuing question is on the King Amendment to the Turbo Amendment. Are you ready for that question? The motion on the floor is to amend to 2.3% the amendment to increase to 2% the percentage of the FY25 budget to be dedicated to human services funding. 
All those in favor of the King Amendment to increase the percentage to 2.3 percent, please rise and say aye. Please be seated. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. And the King Amendment is defeated. Uh, we now return to the continuing uh, question being the um, motion to amend Article 16 to 2 percent of the FY25 budget. Are you ready for that question? Ms. Silver. Sonia Silbert, uh, District 9. Um, I just wanted to um, echo what had been said earlier about the fact that the, the committee um, does a really uh, uh, rigorous and a very self-contained um, job of not um, hitting the ceiling if they don't think the applications meet their criterion. And I just want to advocate for that 2% um, gives the committee the flexibility to meet the needs in our town. Um, we don't know what will happen in the next year. There have been a lot of really intense tragedies that have happened in the past year to our human services community in particular, um, plus the flooding, plus some other things. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in the next year in terms of um, hard, hard stuff that we're all going to deal with. There's a very real possibility by this time next year, the federal government could really gut um, funding for a lot of human services when we're looking at what might happen in the election. Um, I really want our community to have the flexibility to meet needs um, that we can't predict right now. And I trust this committee to not spend money that, that isn't being responsibly used. Um, and um, echoing what Paula had said, that this funding is really important to nonprofits because it's for general support. That allows um, our local agencies to use other funding to meet emergencies, um, like what happened almost a year ago now to um, our social service agencies that had to really step up in a really big way um, after a really immense tragedy. So I really want to advocate for giving our um, committee the flexibility to meet needs that we can't necessarily predict right now, and I trust them um, to do due diligence to make sure our money is being used responsibly. Thanks. Question before the body is whether to amend the Article 16 from 1.4% to 2%. Is there any further discussion? Ms. Morgan. Thank you, Robin Morgan, District 2. Um, I would just like us as a body to take a, a sort of evidence-based approach to consideration of this percentage. So we all um, voted to pass the human services budget earlier, and that was created on a recommendation of last year's RTM to fund up to 2%, and the committee chose to fund it at an amount that uh, is equivalent to about 1.7%. So I feel um, it's hard for me to understand why the select board made a motion that only includes 1.4%, which would represent a diminishment of the funding that we are putting into human services compared with um, the, the budget that we just voted on. So for that reason, if, if this is, an amount that we as a body have all agreed is supportable about funding our human service agencies, then I would say that we need to do the same process again and allow the committee the ability to spend up to 2%, recognizing that they will not spend more than is merited and um, trust in the committee to make that judgment. Thanks. Zeke. comment piggybacking up off of what Sonia said, and this is something I've thought about before, is the argument when I was present uh, at one of the meetings, um, the, the so-called public forums to um, 
push the agenda to transfer the, the EMS services to the fire department, one of the arguments that was made was accountability, over and over again actually, was accountability that if the town financed these services, and these services were accountable to the town, so I don't understand why the same argument wouldn't apply when we're talking about using town funds to fund these services that support vulnerable and important members of the community. The question is whether to amend Article 16 to 2%. Are you ready for that question, Mr. Agave? Spoon Agave, District 8. Um, a little historical note, um, for most of this town's history, it had to take care of its own. There were no federal programs, there were no state programs, and that was from our founding in the early 1700s all the way through the 1930s. The first help we ever got was uh, through the New Deal, and that was very limited. And then there were some more programs added in the 60s and 70s. Um, but for most of our history, this town, and I think back to some of the budgets that I looked at that were written in the 1920s and 30s, we spent about 8% of the town's budget on what we would now call social services. And in fact, in the worst of times, at the very depth of the Depression in 1931, the town voted yet another 1.5% to help the unemployed in this town. So in the worst of times, we were spending 9.5%. So uh, um, I, I hope when I see all these cars that ride around with license plates that say, Vermont strong, that this is what they meant. Question before the body is whether to amend Article 16 to 2%. Are you ready for that question? All right, so on Article 16, now before the body is whether to amend from 1.4% to 2%, the percentage of the FY25 budget um, that the human services funding will be authorized to allocate, um, that being the turbo amendment. Oh. All those in favor of amending to 2%, please stand and say aye. aye. You can be seated, thank you. All those opposed to amending to 2%, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you've amended Article 16 to 2 percent. Uh, the continuing article before the continuing motion before the body is whether to direct the select board to allocate to human services funding in the FY26 budget an amount equivalent to up to 2 percent of the FY25 budget. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor of that motion, please rise and say aye. Thank you, you can be seated. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have adopted Article 16 as amended. Moderator recognizes Mr. Goodnow on Article 17. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I move to set the committee membership of the Representative Town Meeting Human Services Committee to 11 members. Second. Mr. Kennedy uh, um, has seconded Mr. Goodnow's motion. It's been moved and seconded that the committee membership of the Representative Town Meeting Human Services Committee be set at 11 members. Is there any discussion? Mr. Carville. George Carville, West Prattero. Mr. Martin, maybe you can clear this up. The motion as just made seems to be missing some of the verbiage in the warning. Um, uh, maintaining the number of committee members and whether or not they're going to be nominated from the floor and so forth. Uh, are we? Am I confused? Yes. 
That does appear to be correct. The town clerk is queried. All right. All right. Um, with unanimous consent and absent objection, um, the motion will now read um, to set the committee membership of the representative town meeting human services committee at 11 members to be elected at the annual representative town meeting and to maintain this number of committee members until rescinded or amended by warrant article and vote of the representative town meeting. Any objection? No, the next article is to pick the members. Is there an objection? Very good. Is there any discussion about that now expanded motion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is to set the committee membership of the representative town meeting, human services committee to 11 members to be elected at an annual representative town meeting and maintain this number of committee members until rescinded or amended by warrant article and vote of the representative town meeting. Ms. Melton. Paula Melton, District 7. I just want to make sure, so in the, in the article it says at no more than 11 members and both times you've read it, you've said exactly 11. So are, which one are we voting on? I had no more than 11 members with unanimous consent, absent objection. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> so now the motion reads, to set the number of human services committee members at no more than 11 members, with those committee members to be elected at the annual representative town meeting, with that number maintained until rescinded or amended by warned article and vote of the representative town meeting. Are there any questions now? All those in favor, please rise and say aye. 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 Thank you, you can be seated. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes have it and you've adopted article 17. On article 18, moderator recognizes Mr. Dr. Reichman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Franz Reichman. Eight, I move to elect or appoint representatives to serve on the Human Services Review Committee for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Is there a second? Mr. Tewksbury seconds. It's been moved and seconded to elect or appoint representatives to serve on the Human Services Review Committee for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting. Are there nominations? Mr. Minor. I would like to um, take this opportunity uh, to uh, nominate uh, uh, members of the committee who look to return for another year. May I approach? Sure. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So the nominations at this time are David Minor, Tara O'Brien, Hannah Cirilla, Trevor Stannis, Aslan Thompson, and Sarah Turbo. We have six so far. Are there any additional nominations? I don't have any additional, but I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank, to thank those that have served in the committee in the past and that uh, for a number of different reasons aren't going to be returning. Jennifer Griffith, John Kennedy, Kip Tewksbury, Zach Wiggum, and Gary Stroud. Thank you very much all for uh, their time and effort. Mr. Garza. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Ruben Garza, uh, District 9. Um, I am not at this point going to be um, putting forth any nominees for this committee. Um, I will be voting on the article when the nominees do. However, um, I um, wanted to make a comment about the type of persons that we are going to do and the type of oath and what they are supposed to be doing. Um, there is a concerning level of, of obscurity behind this committee's decision-making process. Um, for example, as verified to me by the board chair, all applicants are denied appeals. Uh, there are no notices of decision mailed to applicants. 
um, the scoring rubrics are hidden behind deliberation. And um, as the chair has pointed out to me in previous uh, conversation, not open for public uh, consumption, um, even as this committee is deciding on public money. Um, therefore, what I'm doing now is urging the select board, future select boards, the town staff, to direct this committee to make scored rubrics available to the public, um, that they send notices of decision and enact an appeal process um, in future uh, decision makings, um, and to potential committee members to make an oath or a promise to these same measures, um, accountability starts with transparency, which has been lacking in this committee. Thank you. We're looking for nominations, please, under Article 18. Are there any further nominations to the Human Services Review Committee? Ms. Turbo. I nominate Robin Morgan. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Stroud. Gary Stroud, District Great. I'd like to nominate Zeke. Zeke King is nominated. Any further nominations? The motion on the floor is to elect or appoint representatives to serve on the human... I'm sorry, I'm not a cell phone kind of guy. I have a question for the town attorney. Um, there are circumstances where the moderator is authorized to make additional appointments. Um, absent that authority being in this motion, is this membership now fixed if all these people are elected without the authority to appoint more? I think you have the ability to appoint more. Uh, we're not up to 11 yet, so it would be up to you to appoint in the absence of uh, three more, three or four more nominations. Because it's a representative town meeting committee, it doesn't need to be included in the motion? It's not part of the motion. That's why I'm inquiring. All right. Um, uh, so, absent objection, um, I would uh, amend the motion to elect those people and to authorize the moderator to make additional inter appointments to the Human Services Review Committee uh, for a period to expire at the next annual representative town meeting. Is there objection? Excellent. So, the motion that's now in front of the body is to elect um, to elect David Minor, Tara O'Brien, Hannah Cirilla, Trevor Stannis, Aslan Thompson, Sarah Turbo, Robin Morgan, and Zeke King to the Human Services Review Committee for a term of one year until the 2025 representative town meeting and to authorize the moderator to make additional interim appointments to the Human Services Review Committee for a term to expire at the next annual representative town meeting. Are you ready for that question? All those in favor, please rise and say aye. 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 Thank you, you can be seated. Any, all those opposed? Um, the ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you've adopted adopted Article 18. Uh, Article 19, moderator recognizes Peter Case. Peter Case, District 8. I move that the following people be appointed to serve on the Board of Trustees for the Brooks Memorial Library for a three-year term from 2024 to 2027. Leo Schiff, Circa A. Kaufman, and Kate O'Connor, and that Margaret Atkinson be elected to serve a two-year term from 2024 to 2026. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Mr. Kennedy. It's been moved and seconded that, the, that Leo Schiff, Circa Kaufman, and Kate O'Connor uh, be appointed to serve 
on the Brooks Memorial Library Board of Trustees for a three-year term from 2024 to 2027, and that Margaret Atkinson be elected to serve a two-year term from 2024 to 2026. Are there any additional nominations? Are you ready for that question? All those in favor of appointing Leo Schiff, Circa Kaufman, and Kate O'Connor to three-year terms on the Brooks Memorial Library Board of Trustees, and Margaret Atkinson to a two-year term on the Brooks Memorial Library Board of Trustees, the former being 2024 to 2027, and the latter from 2024 to 2026. Please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you, you can be seated. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes have it, and you've adopted Article 19. Um, we're now on to Article 20, Other Business. Moderator recognizes Elizabeth McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I have two items to discuss. The first is a motion regarding long-term employee resolution. Whereas four highly valued Town of Brattleboro employees have retired since the last town meeting. Whereas wastewater treatment chief operator Harvey Dix II was first employed by the Town of Brattleboro on September of 1983 and faithfully served the community of Brattleboro for 40 years. Whereas Finance Assistant Director, Treasurer, Deborah DeRochers was first employed by the Town of Brattleboro on October 1994 and faithfully served the community of Brattleboro for 29 years, whereas Finance Treasury Clerk Brenda Emery was first employed by the Town of Brattleboro on October 2001 and has faithfully served the community of Brattleboro for 22 years. Whereas wastewater treatment plant operator Michael Ethier was first employed by the town of Brattleboro on September 29, 1986 through June 26, 1995, and he returned on October 5, 2009 through September 8, 2023 and faithfully served the community of Brattleboro for a total of 22 years. And whereas each of these long-term employees contributed significantly to the town during their careers and whereas the daily contributions of employees like these are crucial to a well-functioning town government that supports its community. Now therefore, be it resolved that this town meeting on its own behalf and on behalf of the entire town are grateful and thank Harvey Dix II, Deborah DeRocher, Brenda Emery, and Michael Ethier for their many years of service to the town of Brattleboro. We can adopt that by acclamation. Moderator recognizes um, Ms. McLaughlin again. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is my pleasure to now say a few words of gratitude for Ian Goodnow's four years of service to the town as select board member and two years as select board chair. I stated a few years ago that Ian exhibited grace under fire. Ian has been gracious, a gracious front man to the Brattleboro Select Board. It is a time-consuming, painstaking job, and please remember that it is not a job, it is a volunteer elected position with a stipend. Ian must like spinning plates in the air, as evidenced by his work, simultaneous to the select board service, at his full-time job, first as a lawyer in training, while he also studied for the bar exam, 
passed the bar and is now a full-fledged Vermont attorney, all while serving as our select board chair. Future lawyers of Brattleboro take note. <laughs> and he also runs ultra marathons. How does he do it? He's light on his feet for sure. You may have seen him running through town, walking to work, and being an active member of our community. The select board is grateful to Ian for his attention to correct legal processes, his polite and kind manner, his welcoming and inclusive spirit, and his efforts to lead discussions and find consensus. But behind the scenes, Ian has also spent countless hours working with John Potter, our town manager, to present issues before the select board and public. Ian's North Star has been accountability and transparency to the people of Brattleboro and strict compliance with the open meeting law. He personifies the high level of civic pride and responsibility that characterizes our town. Ian is a nice guy who for some reason likes town government. He is a wonder, and we thank him, and we wish him all the best. Woo! And we have a little gift for him from his fellow select board members. But he didn't want flowers. <laughs> Moderator recognizes Isaac Evans France. Isaac Evans France, District 7. A group of us submitted a resolution for our consideration, urging Representative Becca Ballant to join Senator Sanders and Welch and colleagues in rejecting funds enabling war crimes in Gaza. This is submitted by myself, George Carville, Marta Gossage, Alex Fisher, Sheila Linton, Farmis, Abby Manukin, Robert Oser, and Kipton Tewksbury. Whereas Congresswoman Becca Ballant of Brattleboro has pledged to, quote, use the influence and power of her position to bring an end to this horrific violence and suffering in Gaza, and whereas 69 elected members of the Vermont State Legislature, including members of the legislature here amongst us, both, sorry, let me read the resolution text, <laughs> including both Vermont State Senators of Wyndham County and two of the three Vermont State res Representatives of Brattleboro have called on President Biden to, quote, demand a permanent ceasefire, end quote, in Gaza, and to, quote, conditionally halt any further arms sales or military aid to the Israeli government, end quote. And 13 Vermont town meetings have passed resolutions calling for a ceasefire. And whereas both Senators Bernie Sanders and Peter Welch voted against a recent bill that would have directed billions of dollars in weapons to Israel and a bipartisan coalition of, 15, of over 15 of Representative Balance colleagues in the House have pledged to vote against any more funding for Israel, the representative town meeting of Brattleboro asked Congresswoman Becca Balance to work against any action, procedural or substantive, that advances weapons for the Netanyahu government and to commit to vote against any bill that includes weapons for the war in Gaza. The representative town meeting further asked the Broadway town clerk to transmit an official copy of this resolution to the three members of Vermont's congressional delegation. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Grace. It's been moved and seconded. Um, Whereas Congresswoman Becca Ballant of Brattleboro has pledged to use the influence and power of her position to bring an end to this horrific violence and suffering in Gaza, and whereas 69 elected members of the Vermont State Legislature, including both Vermont State Senators of Wyndham County and two of the three Vermont State Representatives of Brattleboro, have called on President Biden to demand a permanent ceasefire in Gaza 
and to conditionally halt any further arms sales or military aid to the Israeli government. And 13 Vermont town meetings have passed resolutions calling for ceasefire. And whereas both Senators Bernie Sanders and Peter Welch voted against a recent bill that would have directed billions of dollars of weapons in Israel to Israel and a bipartisan coalition of over 15 of Representative Balance colleagues in the House have pledged to vote against any more funding for Israel. The representative town meeting of Bradbury asks Congresswoman Becca Ballant to work against any action, procedural or substantive, that advances weapons for the Netanyahu government and to commit to vote against any bill that includes weapons for the war in Gaza. The representative town meeting further asks the Bradbury town clerk to transmit an official copy of this resolution to the three members of Vermont's congressional delegation. Is there any discussion? Mr. Evans, France. Thank you. Brattleboro residents' federal tax dollars should we not be used to bomb babies and starve children. That's my opinion, and I know is the opinion of many of the constituents that I represent and the constituents that my fellow representative town meeting members represent. I received an email yesterday from Oxfam America that said, only an immediate cessation of hostilities and safe, complete access to food, water, basic services, and treatments will prevent a famine in Gaza. The principal cause of the rapid deterioration is the Israeli government's severe restrictions on humanitarian assistance, basic services, and commercial activity." End quote. Earlier this month, our U.S. Senators Vermont, along with other senators, wrote to President Biden urging him to enforce U.S. law, which prohibits the transfer of weapons to governments interfering with the humanitarian assistance. UN ex experts said in February that arms exports to Israel must stop immediately. As elected office holders here in the United States, whether it's us as town meeting representatives or state legislatures in the room or representative Ballant, we all have an obligation to speak up in the face of war crimes that the U.S. is funding. Representative Ballant has rightly called for a ceasefire in Gaza, but to avoid complicity or the perception of complicity, she must commit in oppose, to opposing any additional funds for weapons for the genocidal war in Gaza. Thank you. Further comments? Mr. Minor. Uh, just, just a comment about, about the uh, confusion, I guess, that the country is facing. Senator Welch is, uh, is uh, quoted as saying that U.S. that we are dropping food on in to Gaza for support on Monday, and Israel is dropping bombs on Tuesday, and the Amer American taxpayers are paying for both. And a ceasefire is what we need in order to get aid in and hostages out. It is an absolute tragedy. Any further comments? Are you ready for the question? Ms. Morton. Uh, Rick Morton, District 7. Thank you. Um, there was a ceasefire in place for several years up to October 6th. And at that point, horrific crimes were committed on innocent civilians. Deliberately, they were filmed, uh, gleefully transmitted throughout the community uh, where the folks had come from to do, the to, to do that terroristic activity. Um, I stand with Israel. I think we should, too. I oppose this resolution. Uh, every people has a right to defend itself if they're forced to. And of course, there's going to be ac ac accusations that they're excessive. Uh, but we can't believe the numbers that are provided of the uh, Palestinian deaths, because those are provided by the ones who are uh, on the other side. So I oppose this resolution and I encourage its rejection. Any further comments? Ms. Wessel. Mr. Moderator, I fully believe that this resolution benefits one party and one party only, and that is Hamas. Hamas <laughs> is a terrorist organization that rapes, 
that kills, that illegally entered a sovereign state and truly tore the heart out of an ally of the United States historically, and they are fighting, in my belief, pure evil. And a ceasefire, especially a permanent ceasefire, implies that Israel does not have the right to defend itself. Israel, as you know, is the only Jewish state that exists on this planet. It is surrounded by hostile states, and ironically, to this town that claims to be forward-thinking and progressive, it is the only democratic state in the region that follows a rule of law, that has many supports for many of the values that everyone, many people here, value very much. This action does nothing to convince Hamas that they should stop killing Jews. It does nothing to convince Israel that they should not go after Hamas. So none of the, none of the parties involved care what this body does. But it does one thing, in my opinion. It sends a message to Jews in this country that the one country where they should be safe and have self-determination and have a right to defend themselves, because unless this is being followed by some sort of crazy declaration that Ukraine also does not have the right to defend itself against Russia, I doubt that's coming next. If that's not the case, why is Israel the only state that somehow has to justify their self-defense? This is a war that has nothing to do directly with Brattleboro, but it has everything to do with sending a message to... Yes, it is. Thanks for that. It has everything to do to send a message to Jews here in our country saying that maybe your lives aren't as valuable as everyone else's. Thank you. Please, no applauding. Um, Mr. Roser. Robert Ozer, District 9. So it is written, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But when famine is now a real possibility in a country, we've gone beyond what that word stands for. We've gone beyond proportionality. We've gone beyond defending oneself and beyond proportionate response. The United States has been moving to a different position over the last several months it may be too late. Representative Ballant is a resident of this town. And her neighbors have a right to express opinion to her. I would hope that you support this resolution so that this war can ratchet down may not end. I was reading recently Jimmy Carter's book, Peace, Not Apartheid. And what struck me was that the events from 1967 onward are being replicated again and again and again. We need to stop. Thank you. Mr. Sprite.
District Sprite, District 9. I believe it was Nelson Mandela who said, an eye for an eye, and soon we will all be blind. I think that uh, the, um, <clears throat> the cycle of abuse is always tends towards being perpetuated, um, and the wise person tries to find ways to break that cycle. Those who are engaged need to engage wisely and compassionately, um, <clears throat> and our public priorities need to work in support of each other rather than against each other. I, I have concerns in that regard on a state level, um, very serious ones, but nothing like this. Um, Any time we have stepped in, either with our military or with our weapons, we have made the military industrial complex richer and the world poorer. Um, with the possible exception of Ukraine, which I think is a terrible example, uh, since the Ukrainians have very deliberately tried to avoid hurting civilians in all of their efforts, despite um, what has been visited upon them. Ms. Morgan. Thank you, uh, Robin Morgan, District 8. I just wanted to um, return attention to the language of the actual resolution, that the resolution is to urge our, our representative, Becca Ballant, to join the rest of the Vermont delegation in rejecting funding allocation for weapons. It is not um, legislating the actions of either of the um, foreign powers that are involved in this struggle. This is a communication from us to our elected representative. And um, another member had made reference to what kind of a message this sends to Jews. I would just like to speak as a Jewish member of RTM. I do not feel that the actions being conducted by the Israeli government are bringing me more safety. And I fully support this resolution, and I hope that we will vote in favor of it. Zeke. Yeah. Um, what's going on right now in Gaza has been really troubling me and if it doesn't bother you i think that that is concerning how closed off your heart is um but also i just wanted to bring attention um i wanted to object object to the um anti-semitic language that mr wessel used um i'm jewish i i don't like being spoken for i don't like the idea that we have to discard our humanity for Jewish safety, that we can't care about babies and children being bombed and starving every day. Um, the, when Tim said that it's the one country where Jews should be safe, um, I, that's both speaking on behalf of all Jews and saying that there is one country where Jews should be able to be safe are what I'm pointing to when I say anti-Semitism because I think that Jews should be able to be safe anywhere we are. Um, I could make an analogy, um, but I, <laughs> to, to um, I'm also a transgender person and I feel that, um, if, if, but I, I don't know how much this will appeal to people who um, are 
unwilling to care about Palestinian lives because of their support of Israel, because I think they might be the same people who might be a little transphobic. But if we decided we're going to give trans people our own country and you can be safe here, and we need to oppress another group in order to make sure that you're safe in this country because this is the one country that you think you can be safe. Anyone who has a reason, anyone who has any empathy or concern for the plight of transgender people, which is very oppressive right now, would say, hey, that's really transphobic to say that trans people can only be safe in this one country, the Balfour Direct Declaration is inherently transphobic. It was created, I mean, anti-Semitic. It was created by anti-Semitic people. Um, we shouldn't have to be discard our humanity in order to be safe so much that it's we accept killing 30,000 plus civilians for a place where Jews should be safe, we need to be working in our communities to make our communities safer for everyone, every marginalized group, Jewish people, black people, trans people. Like, this logic is just rooted in this sort of bigoted fatalism where, where, where people just need to accept that they can't, don't have a right to be safe where they are. Please, Alex. Hi, all. Alex Fisher, District 2. Um, thank you to Isaac for bringing this up today. I'm tr I tried to have some quick points to say. Um, I personally am a queer Jewish American that has been organizing for Palestinian rights since 2008. 2008. And in the most recent months, I have been uh, able to organize on and be in meetings with both Becca Ballant, Becca Ballant staffers, Leahy, Leahy staffers, and I'm quite involved in local organizing to support Palestinian rights while also coming at it as a Jewish American with a voice that says not in our name. I'm not here or speaking to try to move anybody on this issue the same way I am not being moved on this issue towards Zionism. I have been an anti-Zionist Jew since I returned to my religion of Judaism. And I understand that we are not all here to have our opinions changed. So I'm speaking to folks that are here and are um, open to understanding ways that we can support ending the genocide and support Palestinian lives. And I support this resolution because of its specificity and specifically focusing on harnessing our collective power as a town to stand up against genocide and war crimes. We have an incredible delegation right now of Sanders, Leahy, and Ballant who are calling for a ceasefire. And I'm sorry, I keep saying Leahy, I mean Welch. I apologize, it's very nervous to be up here speaking about this today in general. Um, I think the specificity that about this resolution is that it is showing our um, elected officials that there is a collective power and a collective voice and is amplifying that message. That is what moves our elected officials to take action. So what I love about this is it's not a general ceasefire resolution, though I applaud all of the 14 towns around Brattleboro or around Vermont that have taken that, but it is specific to our elected official that we support her. So to me, this resolution says that we support Ballant when she puts herself out there as one of the first Jewish congressional um, delegates to call for a ceasefire, that we have her back in her hometown, and we believe that what she is doing is correct, and we urge her to move even further towards Palestinian liberation. Thank you. Further comments? Uh, Ms. Carvel.
George Carver, West Brattleboro. Couple of things on this. I hear too many people who seem to equate Hamas and all the Palestinians. I reject what Hamas did, but the Palestinians as a whole, as a people, did not do that. I also reject what Israel is doing in its so-called defense. We needn't go back to what happened before October, the long history there. We only need to look right now at the horrific actions that are continuing to go on, that are funded by our tax dollars, and talk to our congressional delegation to, as you say, we have their backs and keep urging them forward to do what they can to get a ceasefire and stop funding the genocide. Ms. Silbert. Sonia Silbert, District 9, I'd like to call the question. It's been moved and seconded to call the question. That's non-debatable because it cuts off debate. Two-thirds vote is necessary. All those in favor of Ceasing debate, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. Please be seated. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes have it. Uh, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. You've ceased debate on um, the um, Evans Friends uh, resolution. So, the issue before the body is the following resolution. Whereas Congresswoman Rebecca Ballant of Brattleboro has pledged to use the influence and power of her position to bring an end to this horrific violence and suffering in Gaza, and whereas 69 elected members of the Vermont State Legislature, including both Vermont State Senators of Wyndham County and two of the three Vermont State Representatives of Brattleboro, have called on President Biden to demand a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and to conditionally halt any further arms sales or military aid to the Israeli government, and 13 Vermont town meetings have passed resolutions calling for a ceasefire. And whereas both Senators Bernie Sanders and Peter Welch voted against a recent bill that would have directed billions of dollars in weapons to Israel, and a bipartisan coalition of over 15 of Representative Balance Coalition colleagues in the House have pledged to vote against any more funding for Israel, the representative town meeting of Bradbar asked Congresswoman Becca Ballant to work against any action, procedural or substantive, that advances weapons for the Netanyahu government and to commit to vote against any bill that includes weapons for the war in Gaza. The representative town meeting further asked the Brattleboro Town Clerk to transmit an official copy of this resolution to the three members of Vermont's congressional delegation. All those in favor, please stand and say aye. aye. Please be seated. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you've adopted the Evans Franz resolution. Uh, the moderator recognizes Sonia Silbert. Um, Sonia Silbert, District 9. Uh, whereas many questions came up today pertaining to Robert's rules that have made it challenging for members to participate and have slowed the meeting down, whereas in years past, individuals have held tutorials on Robert's rules ahead of town meeting, RTM asks the town to organize a minimum of one Robert's rules tutorial ahead of next year's town meeting that people can participate in online, uh, and, and that people can participate in online for the town to record it, for the town to post it on the website, and, mail it, and email it out to all RTM members for them to review before RTM. Is there a second? Second. Um, Mr. Evans, friends, do you want to speak to it, Ms. Silbert? Um, we've, we, this has happened a few different times in years past. It hasn't happened this year, and I think it maybe didn't happen last year, and I would really just love for that to be 
part of the, the organizing and the planning that um, goes into this. I think it would make a really big difference in the accessibility of being able to participate well, and it would also definitely um, help us move things along quicker. So I'd really appreciate um, if the town would take that on next year. Thank you. I apologize. My role was to read the motion again oh, before yes. Ms. Silbert spoke to it. So the motion has been made and seconded that whereas many questions came up today pertaining to Robert's rules that have made it challenging for members to participate and have slowed the meeting down, whereas in the years past individuals have held tutorials on Robert's rules ahead of town meeting, therefore be it resolved that representative town meeting asks the town to organize a minimum of one Robert's rules tutorials ahead of next year's town meeting that people can participate in online, record it, post on the website, and email it to all RTM members for them to review before representative town meeting. Is there any discussion? Mr. Davis. Andrew Davis, District 9. I wanted to address the last issue, but I'll, I'll address this one. It's a little easier. Um, there is an online tutorial on the town webpage. I've gotten good feedback from it, uh, about it. I did it during COVID when we were not getting together, and I did it more than once. It's a, a recording of that. It's fairly entertaining. I tried to use my best storytelling skills. It's available. You can get it on your phone right now. I also brought this morning, there are, are stacks of them, unless they've all been taken, of a one double-sided page. Uh, it's basically, Robert's Rules has expanded to several hundred pages if you buy one at everyone's books. You can also get a practical guide, which is only about 100 pages. But for Brattleboro Town Meeting, it can be condensed to a double-sided piece of paper. So I would encourage you to take one. I brought them today at my own expense and put them on the tables. If they're out back there, see me, and I'll simply email you one. And I would recommend you go to the town website, go to the RTM page, and look. And there is an RTM, Robert's Rules of Order, tutorial. Um, they're modified from Robert's Rules to conform to Vermont state law and the, Verm and the Brattleboro Town Charter. So it's a unique addition. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Mr. O'Brien. Uh, O'Brien, District 9, that's a lovely segue for saying to folks, uh, I appreciate your patience with me learning today during Article 12. <laughs> Any further comments? All right, the motion before um, the body under other business reads as follows. Whereas many questions came up today pertaining to Robert's rules that have made it challenging for members to participate and have slowed the meeting down. Whereas in years past, individuals have held tutorials on Robert's rules ahead of town meeting. Now, therefore, be it resolved that representative town meeting asks the town to organize a minimum of one Robert's rules tutorials ahead of next year's town meeting. The people can participate in online, record it, post online, and email it to all representative town meeting members for them to review before representative town meeting. Are you ready for that question? All those in favor, please rise and say aye. 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 Thank you, you can be seated. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you've adopted the Silbert resolution. Are there any other matters to come before uh, represent town meeting on other business? Mr. Sprite. Uh, this is hopefully uh, not terribly controversial. Um, it, uh, we the people of Brattleboro, through RTM, in interest of improving both voter engagement and outcomes, urge the Vermont State Legislature, in coordination with our town clerks, to set a timeline for adding the option of rank choice voting to all elections. With the escalating dysfunction in our overwhelmingly quote unquote, two-party system, we are overdue to find ways to expand the diversity of voices represented. Given the urgent need, we ask that the legislative, 
the, the legislature commission this system by the end of the next biennium. Is there a second? Second, and, uh, and uh, Arthur Davis. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we, the people of Brattleboro, through RTM, in the interest of imploring both voter engage, improving both voter engagement and outcomes, urge Vermont State Legislature in coordination with our town clerks to set a timeline for adding the option of ranked choice voting to all elections. With the escalating dysfunction in our overwhelmingly in our overwhelmingly two-party system, we are overdue to find ways to expand the diversity of voices represented. Given the urgent need, we ask that the legislature commission this system by the end of the next biennium. And Mr. Sprite, you're recognized to speak to the resolution. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to take a poll. How many people know what ranked choice voting is? I would say that's approximately half. Um, for the rest of you, it is very simply the option on a ballot to give a uh, second, third, perhaps fourth choice in a very contested race. Um, with the goal of ending up with uh, somebody elected who gets at least 50% of the votes. Um, what happens is in the first round, if somebody doesn't get 50%, uh, you drop the lowest vote getter and take their second choices and put it back in the mix. Um, the, uh, and hopefully then get 50%. And if it doesn't happen then, you go through the process until you end up with somebody with 50%. Uh, there are some fun stories out there uh, where there's been a real horse race, and by the end, the person who gets 50% is someone a lot of people liked but didn't believe would get um, the plurality of votes and so didn't get the first choice votes. So it is a wonderful um, counterbalance to the voting for the lesser of two evils situation. Uh, so I, I think, you know, we don't have a lot of very contested races in Vermont. It might encourage a few more, which I don't think would be a terrible thing, but at a minimum, this would make us a, uh, a good role model, as we have been in the past on other issues, to uh, try and spur a more democratic voting process and elections. Thanks. Ms. Cooley. I'm going to be in favor of this. Um, this has happened in Maine, and there's been a lot of um, it's had a really positive outcome in the state of Maine. So um, if you read about that, if you're interested, you'd see that it's had good outcomes for the democratic process there. Ms. Davis. Arthur D Davis, District 8. Um, yeah, it's actually used in Maine and Alaska, and I believe that there are five or maybe six other states that are um, that have this um, have have a process or a ballot initiative uh, in process to put this into place. Um, one of the things that I'm I'm most excited about um, with this type of system in terms of um, how it's been reported to have worked in other states um, is that. Um, candidates have less of a incentive to um, really uh, dig into like in, uh, negative campaigning is is much diminished because people are not just compo competing for someone's first choice vote but are also competing for people's second or third choice and I think that there has been uh, from what I've read a lot more um, uh, civil campaigning and people using campaigns to talk about policy issues that they would bring forward as elected officials rather than um, kind of um, negatively campaigning against their opponents. Ms. Kornheiser. Representative Emily Kornheiser, District 7. Um, I have previously sponsored legislation about using ranked choice voting in certain elections, but um, 
with apologies to our brilliant town clerk, I wonder if I can inquire as to um, the complications on using this in every election and the serious research that she has done over the last few years to explore these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kornheiser. Um, so this is an interesting topic. It's one that um, when I actually worked for a nonprofit in Maine, I worked to push ranked choice voting um, in Portland, Maine. Um, there are a lot of merits to it. Um, it, as, as Mr. Davis talked about, it gets rid of um, negative campaigning. It gets rid of a strategic vote. Um, there's, uh, it, it gets rid of the sort of lesser of two evils um, when, when you're voting, um, it gets rid of that party line voting and, and people tend to vote more for a candidate and their platform rather than their party. Um, that all being said, um, our elections are extremely complicated right now. Every time you go to the polls, every election is different, right? Um, this past election for the presidential primary, you had to declare which party's ballot you wanted. For the state primaries, you get all three ballots. Um, every election, right, in November, um, we mail ballots to all um, active registered voters, but then in March, people have to request their ballots. So voters are really confused. Um, we had a lot of our poll workers um, get yelled at this year. Um, in March, um, I was um, almost... <laughs> Um, physically accosted by a voter um, because they were angry because the rules keep changing as far as they're concerned and it's inconsistent and confusing. Um, the legislature is considering passing ranked choice voting. They thought about doing a pilot pro program for this past March and doing it for the presidential primary. Um, a, the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association's um, legislative committee urged them to wait um, to do research, to do a lot of education. Um, the clerks need training, the poll workers need training, and our voters need training and education on this. Um, if we pass it too soon, people are going to be confused. Some ballots are gonna be ranked choice voting, some are not, um, and it's, it's just gonna make it more and more complicated for voters, for poll workers, and for town clerks. Um, I am going to be on a panel this summer um, where we talk about how can we educate folks. I, I'm not opposed to rolling out ranked choice voting at all. I think we need to do it strategically um, in a way where we can make sure that people have the education and training they need and all the processes and protocol are developed so that it can be a success. I think if we roll it out too soon, it's going to be a disaster. Voters, I mean, we, we decided to close our office the day after the election until noon. Um, this was the first year we did it because before we even reopen, people are calling us being like, what are the results? Did I get my votes? Where, where are we at? And we find that we can't even get those results fast enough because voters are chomping at the bit to know. Um, ranked choice voting means people may have to wait for a week to get their results. And so there's, there's, it's new, it's different. It's not wrong, it's not bad, there's a lot of merits to it. I just think that we need to take our time and we need to roll it out properly. Thank you. Ms. Grace. Django Grace, District 9. Um, I just wanna say that I think it's worth noting that when I brought this up um, with a group of youth voters at the high school, um, the consensus was, wow, that sounds really cool. Um, for the reason that I think a lot of us are, and not just youth, I think a lot of voters look in the headlines and we see, wow, we're choosing between, yeah, a lesser of two evils and there's not a lot of hope. And one thing that someone said to me was, what's the point of even voting? Um, which was very sad to me. Um, but when I brought this up, you know, and explained, I mean, my understanding of how it can dismantle some of the bipartisan animosity that goes on. Um, youth were really excited about it, and I think that, you know, the people who know best about it, like Ms. Francis, should be the ones leading this effort. Um, but I think it's worth noting that 
I think it could do a lot for promoting civic engagement and democracy, especially as we have more and more voters coming. Thank you. Scarville. George Travel West Brattleboro. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, good view of what's happening. I don't think the motion suggests we do anything precipitously, but I would think I think Burlington is also doing this. They'll be interesting to watch. And if this passes today, I would encourage our Charter Revision Commission to take note. Ms. McLaughlin. I just want to point out a less rosy outcome for ranked choice voting in the recent. A uh, Senate primary in California where um, it, there was quite a bit of negative campaigning and also a lot of um, monetary support for one candidate to ease out another candidate. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't the happy picture that we've been hearing about today. Mr. Morton. Um. Rick Morton, District 7. Um, I had the privilege of acting as a, a election worker these last couple of cycles, and I've just been amazed at how hard it is to do that job uh, at the top level and uh, how much work that goes into that, just the way it is now. And uh, Hillary mentioned how there were three ballots going on simultaneously. We also had uh, the issue of uh, youth voters who could vote in Brattleboro, but not in the others. You put all that together, and this is going to create a pressure for more automation, as well as the delay uh, in getting results, possibly. Um, I'm not saying this is never going to work. I just think this is not, we're not ready for it yet. It's it, it also the fact that you've got write-ins. And as it is right now, you've got to handle the write-ins, and even if there's not much chance that they're ever going to rise to the level of winning, uh, you still have to deal with the issue of how to handle write-ins. And you're going through the ballots multiple times um, in order to get second and third and fourth choices. I think we need to be very careful about what we're uh, venturing to here. I I'm going to vote against this at this time. Ms. Davis. Arthur Davis, District 8, uh, and I really appreciate all the comments. Um, it's certainly a complicated issue, and I really appreciate uh, Town Clerk Francis's uh, uh, historical knowledge uh, and prior experience working on this, and also it sounds like um, uh, kind of experience working with the, the current conversation in Vermont. Um, I think the way I look at this resolution is not that um, we are, as a town, saying that we are kind of, you know, asking for this to be put into place for the next election. Um, the way I look at this resolution um, is that we are wanting to to push this conversation forward, um, and I don't think that that um, that that is um, mutually exclusive with um, m moving the conversation forward in a uh, in a robust, educated, and thoughtful way. That it sounds like. Um, is potentially already underway, but I would encourage people to to vote yes. Ms. Gossage. I was wondering if the moderator could please read back the wording, exact wording again, so that we can be aware of um, exactly what we're voting on. Moderator has been asked to read back the resolution again. We, the people of Brattleboro, through RTM, in the interest of improving both voter engagement and outcomes, urge the Vermont State Legislature in coordination with our town clerks to set a timeline for adding the option of ranked choice voting, voting to all elections. With the escalating dysfunction in our overwhelmingly two-party system, we are overdue to find ways to expand the diversity of voices represented Given the urgent need, we ask that the legislature commission this system by the end of the next biennium. I think I'd like to propose an amendment. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to botch it because I'm working on hearing Do you want to look at the seeing. paper when you're amending? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
I would like to propose an amendment. Um, where's the word timeline? Um, instead of uh, to set a timeline, to express our support and request further edu uh, voter education. To express our what? To express, instead of to set a timeline, to express our support and request additional education for adding the option of ranked choice voting to all elections. You might want to look at the end of that resolution as yeah, well, because that asks part. for even more specific time frame. Um, and then instead of the words, um, this system, um, this educational program. Can we, I just want to make sure I have the language. You want to, thank you. You want to strike the words to set a timeline, and you want to add to express our support and request additional education for adding about the, the rank, about the option of ranked choice voting. So you want to strike the words to set a timeline, a timeline for adding, and say to express our support and request additional education about Correct. the option of ranked choice voting. And then you want to strike the word, the um, system, and change this educational program. Yes. All right. So, is there a second? Okay. So that's been accepted as a friendly amendment. So, the resolution that's now before the body um, reads instead. Who seconded? Well, no, who seconded the original motion? All right, Django did. Do you accept that amendment? Yes. Excellent. So, the, that's the problems with Robert's rules, you know. The, the resolution now reads, the people of Brattleboro through RTM in the interest of improving both voter engagement and outcomes, urge the Vermont Legislature in coordination with our town clerks to express our support for and request additional education about the option of ranked choice voting to all elections. With the escalating dysfunction in our overwhelmingly two-party system, we're overdue to find ways to expand the diversity of voices represented Given the urgent need, we ask that the legislature commission this educational program by the end of the next biennium. Is there any further discussion? Are you ready for that question? All those in favor, please rise and say aye. Aye. Thank you. You can be seated. All those opposed, please rise and say nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted the Sprite resolution. Ms. O'Connor had an announcement. I'm Kate O'Connor, District 9, and I want to make an announcement on behalf of the Charter Revision Commission. We want your help in our charter review process. And just in case people don't know, every 15 years, um, the select board or anywhere, it doesn't have to be every 15 years, but at least every 15 years, the select board points a uh, Charter Revision Commission to go over it and review the charter, see if there are any changes. The changes ultimately come to RTM and then eventually have to go to the legislature. Um, just so you know who the, on the, who's on the Charter Revision Commission, Maya Hasegawa, 
um, Joy Turneau, Hannah Clarice, Peter Elwell, Denise Glover, and our uh, moderator, David Gartenstein. We on May 16th are gonna have a meeting where we're gonna talk about RTM. And we really would love all of you to be involved um, to tell us what you think. We're gonna have a specific agenda which we will email to everybody, so please be on the lookout for it. Um, if you want to attend in person, it's May 16th, which is a Thursday, 6.15 p.m. at the um, Select Board Meeting Room. We will also do it via Zoom. Um, if you want to know more about what's going on, the, um, it's on the town website under commit, uh, Board and Commissions. Um, but please look out for this email because we really, really want um, town meeting to weigh in on what we're thinking. So thank you. Mr. Mosikowski. I have a resolution. Oh, Tom Mosikowski, District 8. I have a resolution. Whereas lack of competitive elections for RTM is perennially cited as a problem, and frequently people advocate for greater participation in RTM, and whereas scholars of the subject of town meetings state that attendance is highest when important and controversial issues are at stake. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we request that the select board insert into the warning of the next RTM one or more articles that consider repealing such town ordinances as those pertaining to alcoholic beverages or personal property sales or, cur <laughs> or curfew or public nudity or camping on public lands. So this is a fun one, but it's also serious. Ms. Moskowski, I need the writing, please. It's been moved and seconded. Whereas lack of competitive elections for RTM is perennially cited as a problem and frequently people advocate for greater participation in RTM and whereas scholars of the subject of town meeting state that attendance is highest when important and controversial issues are at stake. Now therefore be it resolved that we request the select board insert into the warning of next representative town meeting one or more articles that consider repealing such town ordinances as those pertaining to alcoholic beverages, personal property sales, curfew, public nudity, and camping on public lands. Ms. Mosikowski, do you want to talk more to this or is it self-explanatory? <laughs> is there anybody? <laughs> yes, all right, great. Uh, is there any discussion? Um, Ms. Silbert. Sonia Silbert, District 9. I mean, good on ya. <laughs> I kind of disagree. I, I would love more folks to be here. Tom and I were on a committee for, for many, many months um, trying to do a, a number of things, one of which was make RTM more accessible and more enticing to more folks. Andy was on it, that, that Mills, like a bunch of us were on it. That was when Andy did that really wonderful RTM um, tutorial. I don't, I don't think that's the way to get more folks at RTM, <laughs> partly because they have to run before the warning comes out. If we're serious about having this room be full, and especially have it be full with a more diverse group, um, we should be providing lunch, we should be providing childcare, we should be provi providing transportation, we should make it able to be hybrid, we should have more comfortable seats. Um, there's a lot of things that could make RTM more accessible to more people. Um, and we haven't taken those steps. And a lot of other towns around Vermont have taken those steps. Um, I'm not adding a proposal necessarily, but I, I just want to underline, like, I don't know if that was a joke or not, but I, it, it is real that uh, we need more folks in our town to make decisions about things that impact us. There's real tangible data um, proven ways to make more people come to meetings like this. And I would love for us to do some of those. Um, 
Ms. Moskowski, I'll recognize you because you didn't really speak to the content before. Just to clarify, it's not a joke. We actually do have powers of ordinances as RTM, and uh, town meetings in other states have powers of ordinance. So it's not, it's not a joke. Um, as far as selecting those items and whether I think they should be repealed or not, that's, I'm not serious about that necessarily, but getting a controversial issue, um, those, li the literature I've read cites examples like that and says that it brings people out. Whereas budgetary measures that have already been considered by the select board and by the administration don't bring people out so much. Um, Ms. Atkinson. Margaret Atkinson, District 8. So I've come to a lot, I think I'm just my 20th town meeting. And you know what would make more people interested in this if they were maybe three hours, four hours shorter? Um, other towns were, are able, when I first, you know, were able to do their town business by noon and then have a potluck in a contra dance after, you know, S smaller towns than this. But I think one of the issues is that folks, that if people want to be involved in decision making and have access to the, you know, levers that move issues forward, there's a lot more opportunities to do that in the town than just this meeting. And I, I appreciate when folks come here with a plan to move something on the agenda forward that they want. But it's not participation in this meeting that's the problem. It's the participating in those meetings that happen every other week at the select board. And so I think, you know, maybe there's work to do in the charter. Maybe there's work to do in the press. But if people in the town really want to make, you know, substantive change, they have to go to not just this meeting, but a lot of other meetings. Lots, 10, 12, 50. Devote half a year to whatever it is that you want to do. And I think it's the understanding of where the lever, the levers really are to pull um, that is missing generally and a little bit in this body. You know, a lot of folks say, you know, we're not here to rubber stamp decisions. On the other hand, we have an elected select board. We have experts who are our town employees who spend many, many hours presenting to us their best uh, work on how much money they're going to spend, what their plan for next year is, and how to staff all the services that we want and expect. And, you know, us maybe or maybe not reading the book and coming in in one day and then tinkering around the edges. That's not governance. We may feel good about it, but that's not really the way this system works. And so I would urge people to get involved in the Charter Commission, and if you really have something that you want the town to do, then go to the meetings. Get on the agenda. Learn how to work the system that we have, because we have a system where we can have power, but you have to have the commitment to showing up. Thanks. Ms. Turbo. Uh, Sarah Turbo, District 9, I'd like to make an amendment, please. Um, I don't have the exact language, but uh, instead of to consider a controversial item, to consider the recommendate that the select board consider the recommendations made by mm -hmm. The committee that Sonia mentioned um, up two years ago, which increased, which had various uh, suggestions about how to increase access to this body. So I don't have the specific language, but if somebody has it, do you have it? So there was a town meeting steering committee. There was a town meeting steering committee. If that's what you're referring to, those recommendations were presented and considered. Yes, I would ask them to be reconsidered. 
or to consider other means, other means to increase access to this body, instead oh. of it being about the topics that are on the agenda, have it be about how to increase access to this body. If your goal is to amend Mr. Mosakowski's resolution, um, some specific language is needed. So I can give I'm you happy this. To. Ms. Turbo has the floor, so unless this is a privileged motion. Yes? I'd like to suggest we table her motion while she works on it. Maybe we can pick up something else and come back. Oh, I think we have a quorum. <laughs> what? Waiting to see the language of the amendment. strike out all of that. Well, all righty then. I can. The motion to amend for Ms. Turbo is to strike out the second two paragraphs and replace them with, whereas a committee was convened two years ago that made recommendations to increase access to RTM including providing a virtual option and free lunch. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we request the select would reconsider and implement those measures to improve access and attendance to RTM. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second by... Um, Ms. Manukin. Is there any... Uh, uh, does the... Does Ms. Turbo want to speak further to that amendment? I will um, say that Sonia's, what Sonia said is what I would say. <laughs> um, we're now uh, uh, speaking to the motion to amend the Mosakowski motion. Um, Mr. Sprite, is that what you want to speak to? Well, I, you know. Sure. Uh, Frick Sprite, District 3 Squared. Uh, I have been a longtime public promoter of RTM, and uh, I really appreciate the, the interjection of humor uh, into this uh, discussion. I think it's a, <laughs> it's a very welcome relief. Um, and I think the, the serious proposals, um, well, the other serious proposals <laughs> might be more in keeping with the um, delightfully boring nature of political discourse in Brattleboro, which um, I, so I, I am speaking in support of uh, amending it. I uh, have gone to 
town meeting, uh, in uh, select board meetings uh, fairly frequently under this select board and uh, have complimented them on having very boring meetings. Uh, one of them I did not get up to speak at, and Ian gave me a hard time not once but twice for not saying it, not participating. And I had to say that, uh, I, you know, when you get on an airplane and you uh, have full confidence in the captain and crew, um, you just sort of sit back and relax and enjoy the ride. Um, but I also felt like uh, my input had been uh, appreciated in the past. Um, so. Uh, I think, I think uh, we don't want to make our meetings any shorter, but more comfortable, certainly, and more accessible, absolutely. Uh, I think the conversations 